A Nightmare on Elm Street was developed by Rare and published by LJN for the NES back in October of 1989. It really goes without saying, but this game is, of course, based off of the horror movie franchise of the same name. A Nightmare on Elm Street is a side-scrolling action platformer and just so happens to be one of the few NES games that is compatible with the NES 4 score or the NES Satellite, which means this game is capable of up to four-player simultaneous co-op. Unfortunately, I have never played this game with anyone, so I won't be able to judge the multiplayer function, but I do think it's cool that it is an option. Now this is one of those NES games that's harshly judged by many people, and I presume that many of those people did nothing more than watch the AVGN episode and without ever playing this game, decided that it is indeed one of the worst NES games ever. Although this game is far from perfect, it is by no means a bad game. So here's how it works. You take control of a teenager. It's not made clear who the teenager is. There are no specific references to any of the teenagers from the movies, but your goal is to make it to the final stage and kill Freddy once and for all. By the way, quick side note, the original concept for this game actually had you playing as Freddy with the goal of killing the teenagers. Kind of wish they made it that way instead. What you're looking at here are photos from the prototype. Issue 8 of Nintendo Power also briefly mentions this game with a picture of an awesome looking title screen along with another early screenshot. Anyway, there are seven levels which are all accessed from Elm Street, which itself is a hub world. There are several houses, including Freddy's house, the junkyard, the cemetery, and a high school. Each level is divided into a couple of sections. In each section, your goal is to always collect a certain number of bones before moving on to the next section. The end of every level contains a boss fight against some incarnation of Freddy. Once you beat a level, you'll return to Elm Street where you'll move on to the next level. Much like the films, in this game it is a challenge just to stay awake. Up at the top of the screen, you'll notice a meter. This meter actually tracks your sleepiness, while in the waking world, the enemies are weaker and less aggressive. Once that meter depletes, you'll fall asleep and enter a nightmare. Although the nightmare world is more challenging, you you do, however, have access to the Dream Warrior powers. Throughout the stages, along with collecting bones, you'll be able to collect different outfits. These outfits offer you different powers, so make sure to keep an eye out for these. Also, you'll come across coffee and boom boxes. The coffee refills your sleepiness meter and the boom box will wake you out of a nightmare and return you to your own world. Also, when you're in the nightmare world, if you spend enough time there, Freddy will eventually show up and attack you, as seen by the iconic Freddy's trademark coming. These fights are really just quite silly. They mostly feel like a waste of time. Freddy merely walks back and forth until he runs away after you've dealt enough damage to him. It's really easy to deal with him here too. To me, these encounters just feel like a, I don't know, silly waste of time. You know, I do kind of understand where they're coming from because in the movies, Freddy would attack with little warning, so I get that, but you know, it's still at the end of the day just kind of feels like a waste of time. For an NES game, I think the graphics are pretty good and I do really enjoy the soundtrack, but considering how David Wise composed the music for this game, it's really no surprise. Now this game is really not the dumpster fire that some people make it out to be, but there are some issues. The first thing I'd like to talk about is this game's theme and atmosphere. Many people have criticized how this game feels more like a generic spooky Halloween game rather than a Freddy Krueger game. Well, yeah, I agree, but I don't happen to see that as a bad thing. I think this game is great for getting into the Halloween mood, and it does have many references to the film franchise such as the trademark symbol. My biggest problem with this game are the controls paired with the level design. Allow me to <clears throat> elaborate. Overall, this game isn't actually too hard, but there are certain design choices which cause the difficulty to rise, so in other words, this game is difficult for the wrong reasons. First, I'd like to talk about the enemies. These bats are the worst. In many sections, they respawn indefinitely. When they show up, they begin making their way toward you. If you've played Wizards and Warriors, you know exactly the type of horse crap I'm talking about here. These bats are just so annoying. Sometimes they'll end up in front of you, which is great because you can just attack them. But sometimes they fly down and into the top of your head. But you can't attack upward, and depending on where you are, this could be a real problem. Like this. This would be so much less annoying if the bats didn't infinitely respawn, because you could just kill them and move on. But no, you basically have to just deal with them as you go. Not always, but sometimes zombies will have spawn points, and sometimes you'll unknowingly be standing on a zombie spawn point, then, uh, then that happens. 
I don't know what causes a zombie to spawn, but in most good games, an enemy will spawn just as his section appears on the screen, which allows the player to know where the spawn point is. Not in this game, however. We also have many platforming sections. Most of them are reasonable, yes, but there are a few where you'll want to pull your hair out. There are some gaps that are just a little too large for a simple jump. Not only that, but these silly jumps are usually paired with numerous enemies, so you may burn through several of your lives just to jump a gap. Speaking of lives, you have five along with five continues. That sounds like a lot, yes, but with how many times you'll get knocked into a bottomless pit, it's not as generous as it sounds. You also don't have a life meter. You die after getting hit four times. You're gonna have to make a mental note of how many times you've been hit. Also, your sleep meter drains constantly, but it drains faster when you take damage. Because of that, and the fact that it looks identical to the boss life meter, it's no wonder why most gamers new to this game will think that the sleep meter is a life meter. The last negative point I want to address are the controls. Now, they're not the worst, but they are floaty and sometimes unresponsive. There were many times where I would press A or B to jump or attack and nothing would happen. I'm guessing that something in-game has caused the inputs to be eaten, but who knows what that is. So that's a nightmare on Elm Street. Yes, it does have quite a few flaws, but overall the flaws don't ruin the experience, and I do think this is a neat little game that's especially fit for this time of year. Now, if you've been watching my channel for any length of time, you may know that I absolutely love reading Nintendo Power. And I just so happened to stumble across an interview with Robert England and he actually lists his top five horror movies, so let's take a look. In volume 30 on page 93, he says his favorites are The Hitcher, White of the Eye, Rosemary's Baby, Sisters, and at number one, The Innocents. I haven't seen most of these movies, but I have seen Rosemary's Baby and The Innocents, and I have to tell you, I love The Innocence. It was released in 1961, it's black and white, it was actually shot in widescreen, which is crazy because that's 1961. It's a great movie, check out The Innocence. Oh, and, and play A Nightmare on Elm Street, that game's good too. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, please make sure to like and subscribe, have a happy Halloween, and I'll see you in the next video. Bart vs. the World was developed by Imagineering and published by Acclaim Entertainment for the NES in December 1991, which was roughly only 8 months after the release of Bart vs. the Space Mutants. Instead of saving the world from Space Mutants, this time Bart has won an opportunity to take part in a worldwide scavenger hunt. Mr. Burns has rigged the scavenger hunt and he wants to get rid of the Simpsons, cause I guess just because he's a dick or something? In many ways, Bart vs. the World is an improvement over the previous game, but to illustrate these improvements, let's take a brief look at Bart vs. the Space Mutants. In every level of Space Mutants, the player is tasked with different objectives, such as collect hats, collect exit signs, pop a certain number of balloons, or cover up as many purple objects as possible. It was not just a matter of getting to the end of the stage, you first had to complete the objective before doing so. To a new player, these objectives may have been confusing. On top of that, players had to master some of the worst controls they had ever experienced. Space Mutants was also a very hard game. You only had a few lives and no continues. You could earn more lives, and to be fair, extra lives were all over the place, but finding them required skill. It also didn't help that you were dead after only two measly hits. In terms of music, well, Space Mutants only had two music tracks to speak of. The Simpsons theme. And, of course, this theme. Not that either of those two music tracks are bad, but it can get pretty grating to hear nothing besides those tracks. Space Mutants is a very hard game with a plethora of issues. Of course, the big question is, does Bart vs. the World fix those issues, and is it worth your time? Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at this game. There are four major areas, China, the North Pole, Egypt, and Hollywood. Within each area, there are a couple of side-scrolling platforming stages, as well as a handful of mini-games such as a match game, a sliding puzzle, among others. My favorite mini-game, by the way, is The Simpsons Trivia. I dominate this trivia. But the mini-games are optional. You can do them if you want to win more lives, and you might want to. Also, when you start a new game, you'll notice that there's a practice mode. This mode is just so you can practice the mini-games. That's it. 
Anyway, Bart vs. the World is a much more traditional action platformer. The levels are more in line with what you'd expect. It's pretty much just get to the end of the stage, although some of the stages are not linear, although they're not too big either. So that's good. The stages are full of enemies to deal with and items to collect. The items you can find are pretty typical. Extra lives, extra health, ammo. You actually have a projectile attack that you can use to dispose of enemies. Honestly, I don't think this game is too bad. The first area is China and it has two main stages. The boat is a good introductory stage. You can learn how to take care of enemies while coming to grips with the controls, which sadly are not any better than in the Space Mutants. There are plenty of items to collect and this level isn't too long. The next stage in China is the Great Wall. Here you just just have to skateboard to the end while collecting crusty heads. Actually, I did find this to be somewhat fun. By the way, crusty heads are kind of like coins. You earn one-ups depending on how many you collect. After you beat all the main stages in an area, you'll fight a boss. Another improvement with Bart vs. the World is that now you can take up to five hits before you die. Also, the bosses feel more like actual bosses rather than some odd encounter at the end of a stage. I know music is subjective, but I do think the music is better in Bart vs. the world. To start, there are more than just two songs in the whole game, so that's good. We still hear the Simpsons theme, but it'll have a different flair depending on which stage you're in. When you're in the pyramid, the song has an Egyptian flair, for example. Overall, the levels in Bart vs. the World are more streamlined and easier to get into. This game offers more content in the form of minigames, and the music has also been improved. Sadly, this game failed to address the Space Mutant's biggest problem, and that is the platforming and controls. In fact, I would say that those issues are even more prevalent in this game. The reason I say that is because there's just so much more platforming this time around, and the controls are just as shitty. The first stage in the North Pole is this ice cave which is green for some reason. I mean, really? They couldn't have made it blue? Like, come on. There's a ton of jumping around. This particular section here gave me such a hard time. Just look at the pathetic attempt I made. The funny thing is that I'm actually pretty good at the Space Mutants, but this part of the cave just kicked my ass so hard. Like I said, the controls are the same, so A is jump, B is to use item, which in this game is your projectile attack. You have to press both A and B to jump with any semblance of speed, and to run, hold A after you jump. If you're good enough to make it out of this ice cave, you'll be treated to a stage where you have to ride icy platforms across several bodies of water. I fell so many times. This level here is similar to that section of the museum in Bart vs. the Space Mutants, but the icy lake in this game I think is easier to deal with, so thank goodness for that. Here's something that I don't quite understand. If you're a developer making a game and your controls are just not that good, why don't you change them? And if for some reason you can't, then why don't you construct stages that would better support your jank ass controls? Like if your controls are loose and unresponsive, then the levels should be built to make up for those loose and unresponsive controls. Unfortunately, that is not the case in this game. Let's take Super Mario Bros. 3 for example. Imagine playing through that game with the controls of Bart vs. the World. It would be one of the worst games ever. But Mario 3 has perfect controls and the stages were built around those controls. That's a big part of why that game is so amazing. Now, I understand that Mario 3 is an incredibly high bar to reach, but that should always be the goal. Great controls and great levels that utilize and complement those controls. Even if your controls are not top-notch, the levels should still support those controls. You want to minimize the discrepancy between the controls and the level design as much as possible. Now, with all of that being said, I'll admit that the levels here are not that bad in terms of design. It's just that the bad controls make them seem worse than they are. Like, why do these platforms have to be so small? If they just made them a little bigger, that would have gone a long way in reducing the frustration. But there are so many places where the platforming is extremely rigid. Just look at this. Come on, really? They expect you to platform across little tiny blocks. But controls are kind of a funny thing because eventually you will get used to them and once you do, they'll no longer pick you off. And then you might notice that this game is actually not too bad. The Space Mutants is the same way. 
If you hated the Space Mutants, avoid this game. But if you liked the Space Mutants, then you may enjoy Bart vs. the World. Well, that's all I have for today. Have you played this game? What's your opinion of it? Please leave any thoughts or opinions down below as they always generate an interesting dialogue. Thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and I'll see you guys in the next video. What is going on, guys? Today, we're going to review Bart vs. the Space Mutants on the NES. Now, this game was developed by Arc Developments and published by Acclaim in 1991. Bart vs. Space Mutants was also released on other consoles including Sega Genesis, Sega Game Gear, Sega Master System, and plenty of others. The story follows Bart as he tries to stop the Space Mutants from building a weapon to take over Springfield. To succeed, Bart must ruin their plans by collecting or destroying certain objects, which the Space Mutants need for building their weapon. Pretty neat story. I'd say this game looks pretty good. At least at first. Level 1, I think, is the best looking stage. It's very colorful, and you can kind of tell what they were going for here. Level 2 looks okay, it's just a little more bland. Krusty Land looks pretty good also. I would say the graphics are the best thing this game has going for it. Controls, on the other hand, uh, this is where the game starts going downhill. The controls are terrible. A is jump, and B is to use your in-hand item, so the spray paint, slingshot, or the dart gun. Select is to cycle through other items, and start is to use them. So how do you run? Well, by pressing both A and B, but you have to press A just before you press B not to waste any of your in-hand items. And even then, you jump first and then run. Yeah, it's not good. The music is also subpar. There are a total of two music tracks in the whole game. They use the Simpsons theme for levels 1, 3, and 5, and a different song for levels 2 and 4. That's it. There's even a boss in level 2 where they just loop a sound effect. It's abysmal. There are a total of 5 stages. The Streets of Springfield, the Springfield Shopping Mall, Krusty Land Amusement Park, the Springfield Museum of Natural History, and the Nuclear Power Plant. In every level, you are required to collect or remove a certain number of whatever the goal is. In level 1, you need to get rid of purple items, so you'll be spray painting a lot. I actually do find this fun to figure out what I can get rid of and how to get rid of it. For example, here I spray paint, but here I can knock the clothes off the lines to cover up the purple objects below. As you're exploring the streets of Springfield, you're going to come across many things such as stores, money, aliens, and skateboarding. Jumping into bushes will allow coins to fly out and you may collect them. You may also spend these coins in the stores for items. Occasionally you'll see people walking around. If you use the sunglasses, you can see whether or not they're space mutants. If they are, jump on their head and collect an item called Proof. If you collect enough Proof in a stage, the designated Simpson family member will assist you with the boss fight. Once you've reached your goal of a level, a message will appear telling you that you now may proceed to the end of the stage, which is where the boss is located. Overall, I enjoy playing through level 1 and I would say that's the best level. Before we move on to level 2, I'll show you a few secrets. When at the Quickie Mart, if you shoot a rocket and hit the E, a 1-up will fly out. Not only that, but if you cycle through your items, you'll see that you now have access to a sound test. So that's pretty cool. If you stand here at the end of the Springfield Retirement Home and use the whistle, Grandpa will appear and throw coins out the window for you. I'll show one last secret. If you purchase the key from the store, you can use it to quickly traverse the level. You may use the key at the Retirement Home and it will lead to Moe's Tavern. To get back to the retirement home, use the key at this door here. It doesn't make sense, but it is helpful. Alright, stage 2 is the shopping mall. Right off the bat, you might notice that the mall isn't as interesting to look at, and unfortunately is not as interesting to play either. Remember the stores you can shop at in level 1? Well, no shopping in level 2 despite the fact we're in a shopping mall. I really feel like this was a missed opportunity. So with no shopping to be done, all we do here is collect hats and try not to die. This level is more of a platformer, which I normally would enjoy, but remember how garbage the controls are? Yeah. So have fun making these jumps. Stage 3 is Krusty Land, and I'm happy to say that this level is interesting. The objective here is to collect balloons. One thing that I love about this stage is you can spend your coins to play minigames. If you win, you'll win coins and 1-ups. The minigames here of course are optional. There is some platforming in this stage, but nothing major, although this ferris wheel can take a walk. A cool thing about this stage is if you have the magnet, purchased in level 1, you can use it to win this minigame here. 
After you've collected the balloons and have defeated Sideshow Bob, you'll head to the Springfield Museum of Natural History. Now, this is where I really start to hate this game. This level is awful. You need to collect exit signs. The difficulty is cranked up with tons of tight platforming. Level 1 wasn't so bad because there wasn't really any platforming, but here there's tons of it. Like, check out this jump here. Ugh. How about... Ugh. Okay, well, I'm safe now. That's good. And what? And then look at this. You get to jump across the red bricks. So this is not fun. And then they make you wash it down with this. How is this fun? And check this out. I don't really know where I'm supposed to jump. I guess I'll jump on this and... Nope. How about this? You're jumping across the bones and we're doing okay. Uh, really? And check this out. I guess I'm supposed to jump on this dude's head. Here we go. And... Nope. And of course, this level drags. It just goes on forever. Honestly, this is where I turn the game off. It's just not fun. One thing I don't understand, though is how you're able to keep collecting coins. You're only able to spend them in stages 1 and 3, so why keep giving me coins? So if you've tortured yourself enough with this stage and somehow beat it, you'll find yourself in the nuclear power plant. This stage isn't as hard as the museum, but it's a maze and ends up being really tedious. Some doors are locked behind a numerical code which you can get from Lisa, or you could just try every number until the door opens, so that's exhausting. You need to collect nuclear power rods. You can only hold four at a time, so when you have four, make it down to the basement of the power plant, drop them off, and continue exploring. You may notice that all the Simpsons family members are here to help you in some way. This stage also really drags, but once you've collected all the rods, congrats, you can stop playing. So overall, it's not a good game. The graphics are okay, the music and controls are beyond terrible. Personally, I do enjoy levels 1 to 3, but objectively, I just can't in good conscience give this game a recommendation. I give Bart vs. the Space Mutants a 3 out of 10. Thanks for watching. Batman Return of the Joker was developed and published by Sunsoft for the NES in 1991, and is a follow-up to Batman released the year prior. It was also ported to the Sega Genesis under the title Batman Revenge of the Joker. A Game Boy version was released, but because it's so different, it's not really a port. It's just kind of its own game. In Return of the Joker, Batman is called on by Gotham City and is told about the Joker's secret hideout and the fact that he's been stealing metal, poisonous metal to be exact, and is probably going to use the metal to create missiles. Return of the Joker is primarily an action side-scroller. There are seven stages, all with a couple levels each. It's not a very long game, but it does have a decent challenge, although thankfully you have unlimited continues. On top of that, there's a simple password system in case you don't want to beat this all in one sitting. You'll see three types of stages. Standard action platforming, shoot 'em up and these one-to-one -one boss fights. The boss fights are pretty unique, as you get a completely different life meter as you take on whatever boss you're up against. Considering how tough this game can be, it's it's nice that these boss fights aren't too difficult, except the Joker, but I'll get to him in a bit. I think this game's biggest strength is the variety. I already mentioned the three different level types, but even within those three level types, there's a lot of diversity between the stages. For example, you might be marching through a snowy mountain, or following underneath a hostile zeppelin. The controls in Return of the Joker work well. Batman jumps with A, shoots with B, and down plus A allows you to do a slide. If you were hoping to lay the smack down on your enemies with your fists, well, you're out of luck here, unfortunately unfortunately, as your only way of attack is shooting or sliding. Speaking of attack, there are multiple weapons you'll come across. Throughout the game, you'll frequently find these ammunition boxes with a single letter imprinted on them. The letter signifies which weapon you'll receive upon collecting. If you shoot the box, you can change the letter, thus changing the weapon you'll receive. The weapons are all different, and I found certain weapons are better for certain situations. I mentioned that you have a slide move. If you slide through an enemy, you'll cause damage. For me though, I found the slide to be a better dodge mechanic to avoid on coming attacks. Be careful though, it's easy to slide off a ledge and die. You idiot! Both the graphics and the music here are great. Sunsoft games always seem to have awesome music. Batman Return of the Joker overall is a pretty solid game, but it's not perfect. Although the level design here is pretty good, there are many times where you'll be damaged by something that quickly flies in from off screen. If this only happened a few times, I could forget about it. But no, it happens throughout the whole game. Stage 3-1 for example, the whole stage is made up of shit that flies in so fast that you don't have enough time to react. You need to memorize the stage and take it slow. You'll 
probably die a lot, but at least you have unlimited continues. Also, there are no health pickups or checkpoints in any level. It can get kind of frustrating if you die right at the end of a stage because you'll have to go back to the beginning. Admittedly, the stages are not long and this really isn't a big deal at all. Another thing that kind of sucks. You'll collect these orbs, and when you've collected a certain number of them, you'll power up and become invincible with a supercharged weapon. Well, this can be great, but so often I got this ability when I didn't need it. What a waste. Okay, now let's talk about the Joker. You have to fight him twice, but for whatever reason, the first fight with the Joker is the hardest. Now, I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything. This fight is horse shit. The Joker is not hard because he's smarter or more advanced than the other bosses, no. In fact, he's much the same as the other bosses, you know, you just have to memorize his patterns. What makes the Joker hard is how much life he has and how much damage he does to you. Furthermore, you do so little damage to him, at least with the default weapon. This is one hell of an endurance round. He often pops out these bubbles and if you touch one, it does 5,000 damage. If you die, and you probably will, and you had a good weapon, well, you'll get downgraded back to the default weapon. If you get a game over, you'll have to replay the stage leading up to the Joker, you know, the auto-scrolling tank stage. But guess what? There are no weapon pickups in this stage at all. So if you died even once on the Joker, you'll have to beat him with the default weapon. It takes forever to kill him and you can die so fast. This is a really long, tedious fight and you better not make too many mistakes. This is where the slide move really comes in handy, although dodging the bubbles is still pretty tricky. After about 20 tries, I finally kicked his ass. After this awful, awful fight, you're rewarded with one more bullshit hard as balls level. Then the final showdown with the Joker, and thankfully this fight is so much easier. But why is the first fight so much harder than the second and final Joker fight? The second fight only took me like three tries. So that's really it. This game's pretty short. I beat it probably within two hours on my very first playthrough. Yeah, there are some annoying things about it, but overall it's pretty fun. If you're looking to get a physical copy of this game right now at the time of this video, price charting has it listed at just over over $97 Canadian, which is 77 US dollars. And for that price, I really wouldn't recommend it, but if you play games any way you can, then this isn't a bad way to spend a few hours. Okay, so I know it's a little weird that I reviewed this game first before the original Batman game. Truth be told, I really didn't plan to review this. It was just a lazy Sunday afternoon. I was looking at my shelf of games, I saw this, I popped it in, I started playing, suddenly I met the Joker and I was like, oh shit, maybe I should review it. So then I started recording gameplay footage and uh, well, here, here's the review. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate that. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and I'll see you guys next time. The Bugs Bunny birthday blowout for the NES was developed and published by Chemco, the same team who developed and published the Mac Venture series also for the NES. Birthday blowout is an action side scroller where you take control of Bugs Bunny as you make your way through six stages, all with four rounds each. The story is that it's Bugs' 50th birthday, and while on his way to his party, many of the other Looney Tunes characters become jealous and decide they will try to stop him from getting to his party. And a big spoiler alert here, the other characters are not actually jealous of Bugs, but rather, they're just trying to stall him so they have more time to set up his party. That's wholesome. Bugs can attack at close range by using a hammer. The hit detection in this game is actually not great, and being that this hammer is really the only means of defending yourself, it can oftentimes be a problem. It took some time to get used to it, but you cannot attack the enemy so much as you have to attack the empty space in front of an enemy, at least if you want to avoid taking any sort of damage yourself. For example, when I was fighting Sylvester, I struggled to land a hit on him. He kept hitting me first. Just look at how awful this is. But later in the game when I was fighting Foghorn Leghorn, I had figured out how it works, but notice how I'm not actually hitting him? Yeah, this was annoying. Also, I really hate that when you take damage, you'll be temporarily unable to attack. While those stars are spinning around your head, you cannot attack. You can still move, just not attack. Throughout the stages, you'll notice many carrot tokens. These act like currency, which is then used for the minigame, which occurs after every round. It's pretty much just a bingo-style slot machine. 
To play, you need 10 carat tokens, and the goal is to get at least 3 in a row. Should you succeed, you'll win extra lives. The carat tokens, once collected, will then turn into Warner Brothers platforms which you can then use to stand on. You have a pretty generous life meter as represented by the hearts on the left side of the screen. Occasionally, you'll find heart tokens which replenish your life. The goal of each round is to get to the end and collect the giant carrot. Most of the time, you'll have to deal with a boss, which is always one of the Looney Tunes characters, but sometimes a stage will just end without a boss. Each level is pretty big and oftentimes not straightforward. They're never maze-like, so you won't get lost, but you can take your time exploring while collecting carrots. This game does not offer checkpoints, so if you die, you'll go back to the beginning of the stage. This game is not too difficult, but it can be really annoying to have to replay a whole stage just because you made a mistake. This game does feature beginner's traps like platforms that disappear, or areas that you'll think you're supposed to jump to, but as it turns out, there's nothing there and now you're dead. Again, having to go back and repeat the whole stage is kind of annoying. There were times where I just became impatient and would rush through the whole level without collecting anything. The music here in Birthday Blowout is okay. It's not amazing, but it does have that hint of Chemco, and that's a good thing. In terms of graphics, I think this game is painfully mediocre. The character sprites are decent, I mean you can tell who everyone is, and the stage environments are not bad, but I found the bigger graphical problem is with the animations. When I attack an enemy, they just kind of warp backwards. When a boss dies, they just flop over. These are just a few examples, but the whole game is littered with poor animations. Another weird anomaly with this game is that the screen scrolling is kind of choppy. It may be hard to tell just by watching this video, but I did find it to be slightly distracting. It's definitely not as smooth as other contemporary titles. If you happen to own a copy of this game, throw it in and you'll see what I mean. Another big problem with Birthday Blowout is the pacing. The game is far too long and there's not enough variety to keep it interesting or fun. There's also no save feature or password function. Like I said earlier, there are six stages each with four rounds. Each stage has a unique environment. For example, stage one is a nice looking grassy plains and stage two is a desert. But each round in stage one is the same grassy plains and each round in stage two is the same desert. As a result, each stage feels like it drags on and on. It also doesn't help that the gameplay never changes. There are no water levels or shooter levels or auto scroller levels. This game does not feature multiple characters or extra power-ups that add abilities. Nothing like that at all. Each level is practically the same. 6 times 4 equals 24. So that's 24 levels of doing the same thing. When I first started this game, I actually really liked it. I thought the controls were decent, I liked the music, and it was just fun. I thought I had stumbled upon a really great NES game that no one ever talks about. But by the time I finished it, which by the way took me about an hour and 30 minutes, I was just so bored and ready to shut this off. Overall, it's not the worst NES game, but it's also not a good NES game. I think this game would have been better if we cut it right in half, just give two rounds per stage. It wouldn't fix the repetitive gameplay, but it would be at least a start. Once we have the game shrunk down to a considerable size, we can start adding in some unique stage designs and abilities and, and really make this game something unique. But sadly, that's not what we got. We just got a really long, drawn out, boring game. It's fun for a little bit, but it really overstays its welcome. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Ron Man, and I will catch you in the next video. Castlevania was developed and published by Konami for the NES in North America in 1987. I've been playing this game my whole life. In fact, I have a home video from roughly 9091 of me laying on the ground playing this in front of the TV. From as early as I can remember, I've had a strong fascination with anything scary, whether it be movies, books, poems, pictures, paintings, ghost stories, UFOs, honestly anything. During my childhood, when my parents would have company over, I would almost always ask our guests if they've ever seen a ghost. If they said yes, I would pick their brains as much as I could. You would think that I would have come off as the most annoying kid around, but thankfully our guests always seemed happy to tell me their stories and answer any questions. I was just so enthralled with horror and the unexplained. I'm happy to say that not much has changed, so perhaps my strong interest in horror naturally drew me to Castlevania. I wouldn't disagree with someone if they said that Castlevania is Universal Monster Movies, the game.
I absolutely love the Universal Monster movies from the 30s and 40s. They have a certain dreary atmosphere that I don't think has ever been duplicated. To me, Castlevania has a similar atmosphere, which is odd because those movies are black and white, and Castlevania is an 8-bit color video game from the 80s. Yet somehow they pulled it off, at least that's my interpretation. Oh man, that start screen is so iconic for me. I've always had a strong connection with Castlevania, but why? Is it the graphics? The music? The level design? The atmosphere? The horror motif? Nostalgia? Well, I suppose it's all of these things. The graphics, music, and horror theme are all integral to this game's haunting atmosphere. When you analyze every level, you can really see how much effort was put into creating the world of Castlevania. Starting with Stage 1, Simon is approaching the foreboding castle knowing that this could be his last day on Earth. He is sacrificing the present for the future, the mark of a true hero. Simon is immediately attacked upon entering the castle. Stage 1 has a great introduction to a traditional haunted castle. It's as though the castle has been rotting throughout the ages, and its erosion is as horrifying as the creatures who dwell within. It gives off a sense of hopelessness and despair, all while giving you a clear message. Dracula needs to die. The hopeless melancholy is conveyed differently yet consistently throughout the entirety of the game. From torn curtains and bleached white skeletons to mummies and Frankenstein's monster, Transylvania has only a small glimmer of hope. And that hope is you. Throughout my childhood, as much as I loved Castlevania, I would get pissed off at it just as much. I could never have imagined killing Dracula, in fact I never even came close. I always wished that the programmers hadn't designed Simon to jump back when receiving damage. Early in the game, that was usually my cause of death. See, in the early stages, enemies deal only 2 points of damage. In the later stages, they deal 4, and considering how much shit is trying to kill you, well, it's no wonder why people consider Castlevania to be too hard. I've said this before with other games, and I'll say it again with Castlevania. It's rigid. You can't just casually stroll through Dracula's castle and expect to win. You need to have a plan, or you're dead. What do I mean by this? Every obstacle in the game has a particular way you need to handle it. By constantly dying, you'll start to develop strategies. Eventually, you'll have a strategy for every inch of the castle. Thankfully, Castlevania has unlimited continues. While it is possible to beat the game with only the whip, utilizing the sub-weapons can greatly increase your chance of vanquishing Dracula. Although they all function differently and are used in different situations, the general consensus is that the cross and the holy water are the most useful. To increase the sub-weapon's potency, you can acquire the double and triple shot items. Don't underestimate their usefulness. Observe. I was 25 years old the first time I ever beat Castlevania, and I have seldom felt that kind of satisfaction. It took me all evening. I'm not a stubborn guy, but I just knew I had to finish it that night, or I'd have to play the whole game again. Nowadays, I have no problem beating Castlevania. If I have a spare 30 minutes, I can easily run through this game. This is nice and all, but I used to spend hours playing Castlevania, and when I would shut it off, I felt as though I had spent good quality time in Dracula's castle. But now, because I can beat this game in under 30 minutes, it's almost as if I didn't even play it. I guess it's bittersweet. The NES is one of my favorite consoles of all time, and Castlevania is one of my favorite games. It has everything I love. Rock and music, haunting graphics, grotesque enemies, tight controls, an intense challenge, and it's short enough to be easily replayable. Starting out as one of the earliest horror-themed video games, Castlevania went on through the decades as one of the most successful franchises in video game history. 
With dozens of games across a multitude of platforms, we owe it all to Castlevania for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Darkwing Duck for the NES is based off the early 90s cartoon of the same name and bears a strong resemblance to Mega Man, so it's no surprise that it was developed and published by Capcom. Despite the similarities to Mega Man, however, Darkwing Duck is still its own game with its own identity. Upon starting a new game, you're told that a crime wave has broken out, and Fowl, a criminal organization led by Steelbeak, is responsible. So your job is to bring all the criminals to justice and collect all the stolen loot. At first you're given a level select, though you only have access to the first three levels. After you clear these, you're given access to three more. After that, it's the final level. You can walk, jump, and shoot just like Mega Man, but Darkwing Duck has a few different tricks up his sleeve. If you press and hold up on the D-pad, Darkwing will hold up his cape and block small projectiles. Pressing and holding down will allow you to duck. You can also shoot while ducking. Perhaps the biggest difference between this and Mega Man is that you can cling onto some ledges, which overall adds a different dynamic to the platforming. Sometimes when a game adds its own thing, it's not always a good thing. Thankfully, Darkwing Duck, it's a great thing. This game is fantastic. It provides a familiar yet refreshing experience. Darkwing's weapon is the gas gun. Throughout the levels, you can pick up different gas adapters, which of course, change your attack. For example, the arrow gas not only damages enemies, but you can use it to climb walls. Though your gas adapters don't have infinite use, you can refill them by collecting gas canisters. In total, there are three different gas adapters, but keep in mind that you can only have one at a time. Your health is represented by this heart, and you only have four hit points. Thankfully, you can often refill your health by picking up first aid kits. You're also able to collect diamonds and gold bars, but they just add to your points. Now, Darkwing Duck is not the hardest game ever, but it's certainly not the easiest. First time I played this, I was a little surprised at how much my ass got kicked, but eventually I did figure it out. I recommend keeping the arrow gas as long as possible, not only for its ability to reach higher areas, but because it also does a lot of damage to the bosses. Speaking of which, when it comes to the bosses, thankfully they don't disappoint. Like the rest of the game, they require you to utilize the game's mechanics. When you fight Quackerjack, you need to have a good understanding of jumping, clinging, and dropping off platforms. When you fight Moliarty, first shoot one of his machines. When it breaks, he'll fix it, and that's your chance to light him up. I absolutely love that they clearly put effort into this, as most bosses have unique and inventive designs. The controls work really well, but there was a bit of an adjustment period for me. Typically, when I jump in a 2D platformer, I tend to also hold up on the D-pad, which normally doesn't matter. In Darkwing Duck, even in the air, he'll hold up his cape as a shield, which is awesome. But when you have your cape up, you can't shoot. So there's a few times where I meant to jump and shoot something, but didn't. Another thing that took a while was the platforming, and more specifically, the clinging and dropping from platforms. It works great, don't get me wrong, but there is a bit of a learning curve, for me at least. Hidden throughout the game are bonus levels. To uncover them, you have to shoot them, but they're hidden, so you won't know where they are until you accidentally hit one. In the bonus schemes, you're able to obtain more items, whether it's gas, diamonds, gold, health, whatever. So, uh, that's Darkwing Duck. It's a fantastic 2D action platformer with great graphics, great music, tons of charm, fun mechanics, and a solid difficulty. That's why I give Darkwing Duck for the NES a 9 out of 10. So if you haven't played this game, I highly recommend that you do. And if you've played it, I still recommend you play it. Play this no matter what. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Please give a like, please subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next week. What is going on, guys? Today, we're going to review Demon Sword for the NES. Demon Sword is an action side-scroller that was developed by Toes and published by Taito. Demon Sword follows a warrior named Victor, who must stop the Dark Fiend and his Demon Horde. Now first, let's take a look at the graphics. The levels look quite nice, and the sprites do as well. The character animation isn't bad, but I have seen better. The way Victor swings his sword is very smooth and looks great. Also, you may notice that the game goes for a more mature look, something that's a little different than, say, Mario. So if you don't like cartoony, you might like this game, at least for the visual effects. The music of Demon's Sword is also well done, although it is lacking in variety. For example, there are only two level themes, a boss theme, a mini boss theme, and a theme for the shrine, and there are a few other tunes thrown in there as well. So there isn't much variety, 
but at least the few tracks that we get are good. Sometimes this game's music even gets stuck in my head. The sound effects are also well done. The slash of the sword sounds great, and all the other nuances are perfectly acceptable. The game's controls are good, but not amazing. A is for the sword, B is for the projectile, select is to use any spell that you have equipped, start is pause, down is to duck, left and right obviously move you in that direction, and lastly, up is to jump. Now, I know what you're thinking. I hate pressing up to jump, and you know, usually I would agree with you, but in the case of Demon Sword, it really does work. You see, in Demon Sword, you're not required to do precise precision platforming, so to speak, and it is not that type of game, so pressing up to jump doesn't hinder the experience. It feels fine. That brings me to the gameplay. Demon Sword has seven stages, and they aren't too long, so if you're good at Demon Sword, you can probably crush this game within a half an hour. Each stage of Demon Sword has its own identity, and that the stages all look unique, though the goal is always the same. To get to the end of the stage and kill the boss. Not all levels scroll horizontally either. Some of the levels scroll vertically, and even some do both. So that's kind of a neat touch. I will admit, though, that the level design is kind of lacking. All the levels look different, but there isn't really anything interesting to find in them. Also, the stages even seem to repeat sections. Like, take a look at this. Wait, didn't I already see this already? And this happens in more than one stage. So the levels look nice, but they otherwise are not very interesting. Every two stages, your sword grows, which extends the range of attack and raises the damage output. Also, in every stage there are multiple doors called Mystic Gates, which lead you to one of two places. A mini-boss or the Power Shrine. In the Power Shrine, you're able to get a Power Dart that permanently raises your attack damage for the projectile, not the sword and there is only one power dart per stage, excluding the first stage, which there is no upgrade. You also might get a spell in the power shrine. In the mini-boss room, you, of course, fight the mini-boss. If you kill him, he'll likely drop a consumable spell. These spells are useful, though I usually don't bother with them. Sometimes the mini-boss will also drop the power dart. Once I get the power dart, I generally don't go in any more mystic gates until the following level. I say this because you can continue to enter mystic gates as long as you have keys though all you'll get are consumable spells. Let's take a look at the heads-up display. That's your life meter. That's your power meter, which actually represents the strength of your projectile. That's your score, your lives, and the strength of your sword. As your sword grows, so does that meter. It's actually pretty simple. Now let's take a look at the items. Enemies will drop them randomly. These are keys. They seem to be the most common drop in the game and allow you to enter mystic gates. These are red spheres, for each red sphere will replenish one square of health upon death. These are black spheres, they raise maximum health by one square upon death. Those are the most important items in the game, so always look out for the red and black spheres. This here is the phoenix, and he will pull you out of a bottomless pit and allow you to fly for a short time. This is a great item, although its usefulness extends to only the first level as all other levels don't have bottomless pits. And like I said earlier, you don't have to worry about that precise platforming. So those are the items that you can stockpile. What about other items? Well, let's take a look. The other items only last for a limited amount of time upon collecting them. This is the wheel dart. It allows you to throw a projectile in four directions simultaneously. This is called an arrow. It increases the speed of your projectile. This here is invincibility and makes two copies of you, so three of you in total. So those are your items. When playing this game, I would recommend taking time in every level to farm for items. The keys and spheres are very important, so if you rush through a level, which you can absolutely do, you'll miss collecting these, and the game does get pretty tough, so you'll want all the help that you can get. Also, about farming. If you farm too long, you'll get attacked by the undead skeleton dogs. These guys do crazy damage, and it's best to start moving if you see these guys. I'm pretty sure there are a sort of time limit to the stage, as there is no traditional timer. It is possible to kill the demon dogs and collect items, but I find that they're usually not worth it. Although if you have invincibility, you know, why not? Now let's take a look at the spells. You acquire spells from Mystic Gates, either by killing the midi boss or from the shrine. There are three spells. There's lightning, which kills all enemies on screen. The power beam, which shoots a beam straight ahead. 
and a fire sphere which provides a protective barrier around Victor. As I said before, I tend to not use them as I find them arbitrary. I just stick with the sword and shuriken. So that's Demon Sword. The graphics are good and has a mature look to it. There are plenty of items to collect and killing things is fun. The controls might not be for everybody and the level design might bore you, but at least this game doesn't drag on. There is a password system in case you do feel like it is dragging. If you get a game over, press and hold down, and then press B-A-B-A, -B -A, and you'll get a password. To enter the password, on the startup screen, press and hold up, and press A-B-A-B. -B. It is absolutely not intuitive, but it is there. Luckily, the cartridge doesn't cost very much if you are interested in playing Demon Sword. Overall, I give Demon Sword a 7 out of 10. Thanks for watching. Bram Stoker's Dracula is a side-scrolling action platformer that was developed by Probe Software and published by Sony ImageSoft for the NES back in September 1993. Bram Stoker's Dracula was also released on a ton of other platforms like the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Game Gear, and the Sega CD, just to name a few. This game is actually based off of the Francis Coppola film of the same name, which of course is based off of the Bram Stoker novel of the same name. You play as Jonathan Harker, and you basically just have to stop Dracula. As I said, it's a side-scrolling action platformer. You pretty much just have to get to the end of the level and beat the boss. Your default weapon is a knife, and it's a piece of crap. But you can find other weapons throughout the stages, but they all have a finite number of uses. Besides finding weapons, you'll find health refills, extra lives, clocks that add time, extra continues, and a few other things. You know, all the usual items you see in a game like this. You have a ground pound move that can be used to destroy the ground to reveal all kinds of different secret locations. At first, Bram Stoker's Dracula actually seems like a decent game. The graphics are good, the music's not bad, the controls seem to be fine, and the atmosphere is about what you'd expect. But as you progress through this game, the problems slowly emerge from the shadows. Much like a vampire. Look at this. In the first stage, I fell down this pit, and, well, look at the background. Who made that? It looks like there's mountains, and then the sky, and then a forest in the sky followed by more mountains and then more sky? What the fuck? In a different stage, you'll have to travel by platforms across water, but the platforms blend into the background. I guess no one thought to make the platforms a different color. The graphics aren't totally bad though, and some of the animations are nice. When you turn left or right, the movement is very fluid. Which brings me to the controls. See, while this nice smooth animation is on screen, you actually can't jump or attack, and to me, that got really annoying. Also, if you attack while walking, you're stuck moving forward until the attack animation is off screen. What if you need to get out of the way quickly. And you'll need to because these enemies often appear so fast and out of nowhere. By the third level, enemies almost exclusively do this. You'll just be walking along, analyzing the level layouts, trying to figure out your next course of action, and enemies are constantly spawning out of thin air exactly where you happen to be located. Some asshat made a ghost spawn within the ground. Who does that? Of course you don't expect an enemy to show up there so fucking fast. Another thing too, I hate that whenever you press up or down, the camera immediately scrolls up or down with you. What if I'm just ducking to avoid spikes? I don't need the camera to follow me that fast. Fuck. How about the difficulty? Well, if you're new to this game, you'll probably die a lot. The first stage isn't too hard, but the difficulty picks up rather quickly. Throughout the stages, there are these lanterns, which are actually checkpoints. You're also on a time limit, and surprisingly, it doesn't reset after you die. It only resets after you've received a game over or get to the next stage. By the way, this game does not have unlimited continues. You can earn more, but they're not unlimited. In terms of music, I was actually pleasantly surprised. Upon starting a new game, I thought it was moody and fit the game well. But by the second level, it just sounds like a clusterfuck of beeps and bops. I mentioned that each level has a boss fight at the end. They're pretty typical fights, but my god, could they have at least taken place in a bigger room? These rooms are tiny! Remember how I said the knife is a piece of crap? Well, the game thinks so too. If at any point during the boss fight you run out of ammo for any other weapon, the game will automatically give you a different weapon so you won't have to use the knife. Then why not just make the default weapon something that's halfway decent? Fuck. I actually went into this game with a positive mindset because I played this back when I was a teenager and I remember kind of liking it, but after, you know, trying to get into it here, oh fuck, don't play it. I don't know what happened. I, I don't know, I, I thought it was going to be fun, I started playing and then, uh, I, I don't know, this just stopped, it stopped being good. It's not that it was really all that good to begin with, but 
Well, you get what I mean. Honestly, it's not the worst game I've ever played. I mean, you could do a lot worse, but there's just a lot of games out there that are way better than this. All in all, Bram Stoker's Dracula for NES is just a typical subpar platformer. If you're a collector, you're looking at $67 Canadian or $54 US. That's a pretty steep price for mediocrity. Anyway, guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. I know that I, I've been trying to give you guys good games to play throughout Halloween. I just popped this in thinking that it was probably going to be decent, and, uh, well, I'm going to stick with the review, and unfortunately, oof, yeah, I'd stay away from this game. But thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned, and I'll see you next week. DuckTales is based off the Disney cartoon of the same name, and it was developed and published by Capcom and released in North America in 1989. The graphics and sound here are great quality. Everything looks the way that it should, except... Except these guys here. Someone put on the wrong outfit. Man, this is so much more awkward now that I'm filming it. The music is some of the best and has actually been stuck in my head since I was like five. I still hum the moon theme. As for the controls, they work well. A is jump. A plus B plus down plus in the air is how you use your cane as a pogo stick. This is useful for jumping higher as well as defeating enemies. Yeah, it's kind of whack. I struggled with this a lot as a kid trying to learn the controls of this game. Once I got the hang of it, it was fine. But any non-gamer friends that I have who come over and play DuckTales... Yeah, they, they have no idea what to do. I just don't get why you can't just jump in the air and press B. So in DuckTales, you play as Scrooge McDuck, and you explore five levels in search of treasure. When you first turn this game on, you'll have to pick your difficulty between easy, normal, and difficult. So throughout your travels, you visit the Amazon, Transylvania, the African Mines, the Himalayas, and finally the Moon. You can play these levels in any order you want, and you select them from none other than a stage selection screen. The goal of each level is to defeat the boss and collect the treasure. Each treasure is worth a million bones. Throughout the level, you'll collect diamonds which add to your overall money. There are three types of diamonds, the small, the large, and the red. You will also run into ice cream cones and cakes which replenish health. You know, it, it's... It's funny to think, but, you know, when I was a kid, I always thought that junk food was actually healthy. I thought that ice cream and, and candies were healthy for you. And it's probably because of these games that they replenish health, but, you know, now that I'm older, I feel like I lose health every time I eat one. Occasionally, you'll discover these items referred to as magic coins, and they provide invincibility for a short period of time, as well as Scrooge dolls, which add an extra life. When you start a new game, you'll have three health points, but you can expand your maximum health points by collecting items. I'm not sure what this is called, but there only exists two, one in Transylvania and one in the Himalayas. DuckTales is not exactly a hard game, but when you're playing on hard, uh, difficult, these permanent health upgrades are quite helpful. When I play, I usually just go in order that you see them on the screen, so I start with the Amazon. I remember when I was playing this as a kid and I found out that you could jump up here and go across here, you know, in the status screen, pretty sure I soiled my diaper. And then you keep playing and you discover that you can do it again immediately. So I soiled them again. Yeah, my mom had a mess to clean up. The Amazon is just a nice level to explore in my opinion. In each level, you come across Launchpad. You know, this guy here. Yeah, his name's Launchpad. He's willing to take you back to the level select screen with all the treasure you've accumulated. It's a decent way to build cash, but I usually don't take him up on his offer. In the Amazon, there's a shortcut right here. You can jump up here and climb the vine which leads directly to the boss. If instead you continue right, you'll run into this statue here. He wants you to pay 300000 or he won't let you pass. What kind of ripoff is this? Yeah, well I can be an asshole too, just watch. So you proceed to the boss and take him out with the least amount of effort you've ever put into a video game. Next I move on to Transylvania, the horror themed level. It's a large level with multiple paths to take and mirrors which you may warp through. If you don't know this level, it can be actually quite confusing to navigate, but I've played this game so many times that I often don't explore much of this level. It's, 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 it's quite easy to just walk straight to the boss. Next, we move on to the African Mine. Almost as soon as you start this level, you're informed that you don't have the key and that the key is located in Transylvania, so they force you back to Transylvania to find the key, and then you can go back to the African Mine. You know, going back to this stage uh, on your first playthrough might seem kind of cool. You know, we're going back to Transylvania, now we're just looking for a key, we're not doing anything else. Like, why can't I just collect the key in Transylvania on my first visit there? You have to backtrack. You, you can only get this once you've gone to the African mine. Seems like just a, a cheap way to try to extend the length of the game, uh, because to a new player, 
they might look all through Transylvania again, when in, in reality the key is actually pretty close to the beginning of the level. Not really too sure why they did that, but that's just a small nitpick. But the mines are great, they look great, the music's good, and it's just confusing enough to make you want to explore everything. Once you're done exploring, it's time to laugh at the boss with another boss fight, which takes even less effort than breathing. The Himalayas are an interesting level because... Up here on the surface, if you pogo jump into the snow, you'll get stuck. Not an issue for me anymore, but as a kid wearing a soiled diapy, you know, gave me a hard time. So basically, you jump down a hole, then make your way left, and then up, then right, and you can fight the boss. Of course, there's stuff to discover down there, like the permanent life upgrade, and there's also spiders dressed as bees. So after jumping on the snowman a couple times, it's time to move on to the moon. Now the moon is my favorite stage, and the music is just fantastic. In this level, you aboard a UFO with the purpose of finding the remote control for Gizmo Duck, so he can open the path to the boss. The UFO is big, it's fun to explore, it can be a bit tricky getting on and off the UFO due to this hole. But after you've beaten the boss, you receive a message informing you that your treasure has been stolen, and to get it back, you have to travel back to Transylvania for the third time. Now it's time for the final showdown with Dracula Duck. After you jump on his head a bunch of times, a race up a rope to discover treasure that Dracula stole from you. And that's it, game's done. There are three endings to DuckTales. The regular ending, if you beat the game with under 10 million. The best ending, if you beat the game with over 10 million. And then the bad ending, if you beat the game with zero dollars. Which, it's kind of funny because to get the bad ending, it's harder to do. DuckTales is a timeless classic, although I do have a few nitpicks with it. Number one, the cane slash pogo jump doesn't need to be as complicated as it is. Number two, although these levels are fun to explore, there feels less of a reason to do so if you've played this game many times. Like in Transylvania, I never explore the whole level, I just go straight to the boss. It would have been nice if they gave you more reasons to explore. Number three, this game, once you get used to the pogo jump, is so easy. Like this game is way too easy. If, even if you're playing on difficult, I know this game was made for kids back in the like 80s and 90s, but the pogo jump mechanic is, is not really easy to master. Number four, along with being too easy, this game is just too short. And that's kind of a compliment too at the same time because, yeah, it's short, but I, I love the game world and I love playing this game and I want to spend more time in this game. I mean, this playthrough here took me 20 minutes and I was taking my time. Heck, speedrunners bend this game over in like 8 minutes. To be fair, I do know where everything is in this game. Someone who's never played this game, I can see maybe it would take them an hour to beat it, maybe even a little less. But along with those nitpicks, I still think DuckTales is a fantastic game, and I highly recommend it to everyone, uh, especially if you haven't played it. You gotta play it any way that you can. I give Scrooge an 8 out of 10. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Hey, if you enjoyed the episode, please have a nice day. DuckTales 2 was developed by Capcom and released for the NES in 1993, four years after the original DuckTales game. Because DuckTales 2 is a sequel to DuckTales, I'll be making comparisons to the first game throughout my review. DuckTales 2 is much the same as the first game, but it adds some elements to make it a slightly bigger and engaging experience. Like the first game, you play through five stages in any order to find hidden treasure. Most of the familiar faces from the first game are back, like Launchpad and Scrooge's grandnephews, and you'll see them throughout the levels. As you collect diamonds and other goodies, your total money will grow. After you've beaten a stage, you're taken to a shop where you're able to spend your money on various items like 1-ups, continues, and HP upgrades, just to name a few. One thing I actually found slightly annoying is that if you die, you lose all the money you had. I think that's a bit of a harsh punishment. I mean, I can understand losing all your money upon a game over, but just for dying? You can, however, purchase the safe item, and this allows you to keep your money when you die, but you have to equip it in the pause menu, and once you beat the level, it's gone and you'll have to buy another. Your main method of attack is the pogo stick, just like the first game. But this time, it's easier to do. You just need to hold the B button while in the air. Other than that, the controls are the same as the first game. There are also three cane upgrades you can find, all of which just allow you to break or move obstacles that you couldn't before. They're not all that well hidden, but it is possible to miss them and still beat the level. Thankfully, you're able to return to levels you've beaten. There are three modes of difficulty, although the game overall is not very hard. The levels are big with tons of hidden areas to find. I think they're all well designed and fun to play. This time we visit Niagara Falls, Bermuda, Moo, Egypt, Egypt, and Scotland. Fun fact, I actually live in Niagara Falls, and this game 
is a one-to-one -one representation of what the actual Niagara Falls looks like. I recognize all these locations. Like, I have actually jumped across those logs. Yeah, it's harder than it looks. I still haven't found the real-life crystal flower, but I'll look every year in hopes that I'll find it within my lifetime. Anyway, uh, moving on. There's also a secret level that you unlock if you collect all the pieces of a treasure map, so six levels in total. I won't show any footage of the secret level in this video because I don't want to spoil it. These map pieces are actually pretty well hidden and a few of them even require you to solve a puzzle. The graphics are about on par with the original game. Each stage is colorful with a distinct theme. The music is also very well done. None of the tracks are as good as the moon theme from the first game, but I mean, what is? DuckTales 2 has a completely new roster of enemies, and a lot of them function in similar ways, and most don't require problem solving to overcome. The bosses are also not very intricate. For the most part, you just pogo jump on them. Although I do appreciate the stone boss in Moo. You have to golf swing a brick at him, then pogo jump on him. Returning from the first game are multiple endings, three to be exact. You get the standard ending if you beat the game without getting all the map pieces, the true ending if you did get all the map pieces, and a hilarious ending if you beat the game with no money. I think DuckTales 2 is a great sequel. It does exactly what a sequel should do, and that is to offer a similar gameplay experience while improving on various elements to make an overall better game. They added an optional extra level, a shop to spend your money, the ability to return to levels you've beaten, and they made the levels a little more interesting, such as giving you the ability to hang from hooks and to pass through water via a raft. I really don't have anything negative to say other than maybe it's a little too easy and that I wish it was longer. I think DuckTales 2 is technically better than the first DuckTales, but I do have nostalgia for the first game where I don't really for the second game. Either way, I love DuckTales 2 and that's why I give it a 9 out of 10. I love the fact that my home is one of the levels. I have a Scottish background. My mom was born in Glasgow, so I think it's cool that my mom's home is also in this game. I mean, she didn't live in a castle or anything like that, but you get what I mean. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you next time. What's up, guys? My name is Ron Man, and today we're going to review Felix the Cat for the NES. Felix the Cat is an action platformer that was released in 1992 by Hudson Soft and follows the titular cat through a variety of levels to save Kitty from the Professor. Starting off, this game looks incredible. The levels are colorful, the sprites look great, and the animations are top-notch. The music and sound are both okay. Certainly not bad, but nothing special either. The controls are done well. A is to jump and B is to attack. Can't ask for much more than that. The jumping works well, it doesn't lag or feel floaty, and the attack feels good. Well, it depends on what weapon you have, but otherwise feels good. And that leads to gameplay. In Felix the Cat, there are a total of nine worlds, all with two or three stages each, and the design is linear, meaning that there are no optional paths. Every world looks different from one another, ranging from grassy fields, pyramids, snow-covered valleys, outer space, and more. Throughout the levels, you can collect Felix heads. Collect five, get milk bottles. Collect ten, get a kitty heart. Collect a hundred, get a one-up. The milk bottles are worth 500 points each, and the kitty hearts give Felix a power-up. In a standard stage, there are four tiers of power-up. The boxing glove, which you start out with, the magic, the car, and finally the tank. My favorite is the car, but I spend more time as the tank. That's okay, except it lobs its shots in an arc, so it's easy to miss enemies. And if you're in a hallway, good luck. These power-ups have a time limit, unfortunately. See those hearts? They slowly drain, and when they're gone, you get downgraded to the previous power-up. It is, however, not that big of a problem, as this game gives you lots of hearts. Which leads me to the difficulty. This game is far too easy, for better or for worse. Once you've maxed out your power-ups, every kitty heart you collect is a 1-up, and there are tons of kitty hearts throughout the game. I prefer to have a little more challenge, but on the contrary, if you're not a skilled gamer, this game might be a good place to start. All the levels in this game are your classic get to the right, although the formula sometimes changes. For the most part, you walk, jump, and attack. Although in some levels, you glide or swim. One issue I have with this game is the level design. I just find these stages kind of boring. There are these magic bags that you can go down through, kind of like the pipes in Mario, and they usually lead to a bonus room. But again, the bonus rooms are boring. Every bonus room looks something like this. They only ever offer coins, maybe some milk, and a power-up. I mean, the power-up is nice, but these items feel unnecessary when you're a few levels into the game and have 10 lives. 
Other than those bonus rooms, there's not much else to discover in these stages. It's just get to the right. This game tries to break the monotony with those gliding and swimming stages I mentioned, but I find these levels to be even more boring. In the glide stage, you can just proceed under everything. You might say, well, if you find it boring, why would you just fly under everything? And I think that's a good point, but I find these stages really drag on, so I just want to get it over with. At the end of every world, there's a boss fight. These are okay, but still not very challenging. Something that I find annoying is how sometimes you can get hit by enemies that quickly appear on screen. Like, look at this. Now, I know I just sat here and I complained about how easy this game is, but this in particular doesn't add challenge. It's just kind of cheap. Although, it's still not that big of a deal. So that's Felix the Cat. The graphics are awesome, the music and sound effects are okay, and there's variety in the level aesthetic and design. It's absolutely not a bad game by any means. I just find it kind of boring, and this is due to how easy it is and how little there is to discover. All that being said, I still would recommend that you play it. Overall, I give Felix the Cat a 7 out of 10. Thanks for watching. The Flintstones, The Rescue of Dino and Hoppy, was developed and published by Taito and released for the NES in 1991. Out of the two Flintstones titles for the NES, this is the one that's not laughably expensive. The story here is that a guy from the 30th century named Dr. Butler has realized that he wants some dinosaurs for a zoo. He decides to go back in time to the Flintstones' age to steal some. Well, he just so happens to steal Fred's pet Dino and Barney's pet Hoppy. Fred's alien friend Gazoo can help, but only after Fred helps him rebuild his time machine that Dr. Butler decided to destroy. What a nice guy. Once the time machine is complete, Gazoo sends Fred to the 30th century to rescue both Dino and Hoppy. The rescue of Dino and Hoppy is an action platformer where you take control of Fred as you make your way through eight levels. After you've beaten the first level, you're taken to a world map screen, and here you have limited range to choose which levels you play next. As Fred, your main attack is with a club. If you press and hold B, you'll begin charging for a stronger attack. Being that this is a platformer, you'll be doing plenty of that, but what's unique here is that you'll also be clinging onto ledges while you're platforming. This mechanic takes a bit of getting used to, but it doesn't take long and thankfully it works great. Throughout the stages, you'll come across many different items. There are items which give extra lives, replenish health, increase your number of heart containers, and increase your club charge strength. On top of that, there are three different sub-weapons you can find, such as the slingshot, the axe, and the bomb. By the way, the bomb heavily resembles a Yoshi egg. Using the sub-weapons will cost you coins. It's similar to the hearts in Castlevania. Thankfully, you'll come across many coins during your playthrough. The overall design here is fantastic, and in my opinion, it's because of the following reasons. Number one, all of the levels are fundamentally consistent. You learn quickly how to play and what this game expects of you. Number two, in in terms of visuals, this game has variety. No two levels look the same. We have levels that you would expect, like Bedrock and the Jungle, but we also have an Ice Village, a Castle, an Oriental Village, and the Future, which contains a cameo of George Jetson. Now that's pretty cool. Number three, the difficulty is reasonable. It's not too easy, but it's not too hard either. However, there are times where this game can be pretty tough. I got stuck on the final stage for quite a while. For 45 minutes minutes I was out there screaming I know that because my damn watch is broken. However, this game does offer unlimited continues. Now, to be clear, just because I do think this game is well designed doesn't mean that it's perfect. I do have a few nitpicks, but we'll get to those in a little bit. The developers packed in even more variety with optional basketball stages. In total, there are three. In these levels, you just need to score more points than Harry. If you win these stages, you'll gain a permanent ability which you can use as long as you have the coins to pay for. For it. These abilities include being able to fly, a super jump, and flippers for better swim controls. If you pause the game, you'll see which abilities you have available. I think the fly ability is the most useful as it can often give you just enough push to make tough jumps without having to spend coins. Every time you flap your wings, it costs money, but when you summon the wings, it gives you a free bump. This is great, and if you're struggling with this game, don't be shy about using your abilities. The dive ability 
ability functions exactly the same as fly, except dive only works in the water stage. Like I said, the basketball stages are optional, which means so too are these abilities. If you're up for a greater challenge, opt not to get them. Now I mentioned that I do have a few nitpicks. Keep in mind that these do not ruin the overall experience, but of course this game is not perfect. My first nitpick is that I dislike that this game removes a heart container every time you die. Collecting a cactus cooler will add an extra heart container to your overall health meter, but every time you die, the game removes a heart container. Why? If you're struggling, what sense does it make for the game to get harder? That's like how banks charge you money for having insufficient funds. So you're gonna charge me money for not having enough money? Is this game too hard? Well then we'll take away a heart container and make it even harder. That should help, right? Now because this game does offer frequent cactus coolers, this design choice is mostly a problem when it comes to boss fights. If you die, you restart at the boss, but with less health and no sub weapons. My second nitpick is that some of the enemy placements are mm, questionable. There are times, although thankfully very few, where an enemy flies in from off screen just to hit you off a ledge. Sometimes the enemy placements, combined with some platforming hazards, can really make things tricky. I think the worst stage for knockback is the lake. I died here quite a few times just because of unexpected enemy spawns and knockback. My final nitpick is that you can't change directions on a dime. If you're walking but suddenly have to change directions, you have to wait for Fred to stop sliding. It's honestly not that noticeable, but the best example are these skeletons. After you walk past them, they chase you, but turning around to hit them with your club is slightly more challenging than you'd expect. Again, none of these ruin the overall experience, but I do have to mention them. In terms of graphics, the Flintstones is a great looking NES game with vibrant colors and the characters do resemble how they look in the show despite this being an 8-bit NES game. Also, the music is memorable and very well done. So there you have it. The Rescue of Dino and Hoppy is a fantastic NES game. It's not dirt cheap by any means, but it's also far from unreasonable, at least at the time of recording this video. A loose copy goes for about $40 Canadian or $30 American. Thank you guys so much for watching again another good Flintstones game it just makes me even more angry at Ocean for just coming up with such an awful awful game have you guys played this do you like it have you played the expensive one anyway thank you guys so much for watching and I will catch you in the next video Dinosaur Peak is an action platformer that was developed and published by Taito for the NES in 1994 now there's a lot of speculation online that this was a blockbuster exclusive but as far as I can tell there's no evidence of that whatsoever it just seems to be something that someone somewhere had said and uh, now people just tend to repeat it instead of rescuing Dino and Hoppy from the future, this time Fred and Barney team up to rescue Pebbles and Bam Bam from the other side of a lava stream. You'd think that they would just walk around the volcano, but no, they take the long way. Dinosaur Peak plays much the same as its predecessor. After beating the first level, you're taken to a world map, although this game does seem slightly more linear than Dino and Hoppy. Dino Peak has a total of 10 unique and varied levels, stuffed full of enemies, items, bosses, and mini bosses. Dino Peak did improve on the controls. I I feel like this game is slightly more smooth, which is most noticeable when climbing up ledges. However, they retained that same idiotic philosophy of reducing your health meter every time you die. If you stay tuned to the end of the video, I will share with you what the surprise is at Dinosaur Peak and you won't want to miss that. Throughout this new adventure, rather than going it alone with Fred, this time Barney tags along. This game is single player only, but by pressing select, you can switch between Fred and Barney at any time. This is the biggest feature of this game and the main reason it stands apart from its predecessor. Both characters have unique abilities, which means you will have to use both characters for different situations. Just like the previous game, Fred uses his club and can climb ledges. Barney, on the other hand, uses a slingshot and, although he can't climb ledges, he can climb and shimmy across ropes and vines. Fred's club is a short-ranged attack that you can charge up for more power. Barney's slingshot is a great long-range weapon, but the trade-off is that it's much weaker. There are also two sub-weapons, an axe and a bowling ball. I honestly use these very little. Just like in Dino and Hoppy, Dinosaur Peak has optional sports levels that you access via the overworld. This time, in addition to basketball, we have hockey. The hockey stage plays much the same
same as the basketball stage. Score more points than Harry to win. I felt that the sports stages in this game are slightly more difficult than in Dino and Hoppy. If you win, you'll get... Well, actually, I'm not too sure what. The game never tells you. At the start of the bonus stage, Harry says, Hey Flintstone, if you win, I'll give you something. But when you beat him, all he says is, I don't believe it. You beat me. Here's your prize. It's yours for keeps until you see game over. And that's it. What's mine for keeps until game over? I honestly could not tell what he gave me. I checked out this game's manual and there's absolutely no mention of what you win. The manual doesn't even mention the sports minigames at all. So I checked the only walkthrough on the internet that I could find. In this walkthrough, written by D. Engel, he just glosses over the sports stages and writes, after the game, you receive a prize. No mention whatsoever of what that prize is, so I have no idea. If you happen to know, please put it down in the comments. I had mentioned that the stages are varied. No two levels look the same. This time you venture through bedrock, a kitchen, and a witch's castle, among many others. There are also a couple of auto-scroller type levels like this one where you're surfing across the ocean. Throughout the stages, you'll come across many different items. Again, we see extra lives, life refills, power meter increases, and sub-weapons. What's new are these stars. Every time you collect a star, you'll add a letter to the Yabba Dabba do at the bottom of the screen. Once you fully spell it out, you'll earn an extra life. The overall game design in Dino Peak, again, is well done. Like I said, it mostly plays the same as Dino and Hoppy. But of course, because Fred and Barney both play differently, this does change the pace and the structure. In every stage, there are areas which are obviously designed for one character or the other, like clinging onto ledges or climbing on ropes. But because Fred has a short-ranged weapon and Barney has a long-ranged weapon, there are many gray areas where it's up to you to see what's the most efficient strategy. Okay, so what is the big surprise at Dinosaur Peak? Are you ready? It's a difficulty spike. The final stage is very hard. I got pretty angry at this game, actually. You end up inside the volcano where you need to defeat the red dragon so he'll stop the lava so you can rescue both Pebbles and Bam Bam. This stage is much longer than any other stage and there are many areas where you can be killed immediately. It really is a gauntlet and to top it all off you then need to beat the final boss. And of course, the final boss has two phases. You need to be able to beat all of this without getting a game over. Most of this volcano is trial and error. You have to play it enough times to memorize each part and the most optimal way of getting through. If you get a game over, you'll go back to the beginning of the volcano. This was so annoying. Thankfully, you have unlimited continues. My main criticism here is not that this level is hard, but rather how evident the difficulty spike is. This whole game is definitely on the easy side. If I were to use a 10 point scale to explain the difficulty, I'd say the rest of this game is a 3 out of 10, but this final stage is a 7 out of 10. I know that this level may not look that difficult because the footage you're watching, well, I was able to beat this level on my first try, but I didn't record the first time I played this level or the two hours it took me to beat it. So this time around, I had memorized what to do and that's why you don't see any mistakes. So that's the Flintstones, the surprise at Dinosaur Peak, and again, another really good Flintstones game. I don't think I like it as much as Dino and Hoppy and I really think it just comes down to the levels, but Dinosaur Peak is still a fantastic game that you should absolutely play. Just don't buy a physical, authentic copy of this game. I don't think any game is worth that price. That's, I mean, that's just crazy. I would recommend emulate it or even buy a reproduction card so you can play it on your original hardware if that's what you want to do, but don't, don't buy this game. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Ron Man, and I'll catch you in the next video. What is going on guys, my name is Ron Man, and today we are stepping foot into Camp Crystal Lake as I review Friday the 13th for the NES, which is a side-scrolling horror game. Now, this game has a lot of mixed opinions. Some people love it, and some people hate it. Looking at this game objectively, it has a lot of strengths and some glaring weaknesses, so I can understand why this game has the reputation that it does. This game was developed by Atlas, believe it or not, and published by the infamous LJN. Friday the 13th is obviously based on the horror film franchise, although it doesn't follow a specific movie in particular. You play as a group of six counselors over the course of three days, and the objective is to kill Jason. Alright, now let's first look at the graphics. I find the graphics to be very well done. The campgrounds look good, the forests, the caves, the lake, and even the map I think looks good. It's also nice that there are many different locations. It helps the game from feeling repetitive. 
Jason looks good in his classic purple outfit ripped straight from none of the movies, but I like it. On the other hand, the camp counselors aren't the best looking. They mostly look the same and don't have faces, also their animations are lacking. The same could be said for the zombie enemy as well. Alright, the music. It's unfortunately kind of dull. When you're outside, walking the campground paths, in the forests, in the caves, it just repeats this mediocre 4 second loop. When you're fighting Jason, it's okay. But when you're in the cabins, however, it's way better. It's actually creepy and fits the theme of this game very well. I thoroughly enjoy this music. Controlling your character is easy and intuitive enough. A is jump, and B is for your weapon. It's pretty straightforward. The control changes drastically, though, when you enter a cabin. It takes sort of a first-person perspective while still being third-person. It takes a bit of getting used to, but once you understand it, it isn't an issue at all. Another thing that takes getting used to is understanding the map and how it works in relation to the controls and your perspective. It does take a while, but you will get used to it. When you first start the game, you'll be prompted to choose a character. There are in total six. Mark, Chrissy, George, Paul, Laura, and Debbie. There seem to be three noticeable stats. Run speed, boat speed, and jump height. Supposedly there is also a throwing stat, but as far as I can tell, there really isn't much of a difference between the counselors, so I just ignore that. I've given the stats a two-point scale. As you can see, Mark is the best character as his points are two for all three stats. The second best character is Chrissy. If Mark takes too much damage, I'll switch to her, which isn't a problem since having a lower boat speed skill isn't too big of a problem as it's not too noticeable. During a playthrough, if both Mark and Chrissy take too much damage, I'll use Laura as a last resort as her run speed is also too. George, Paul, and Debbie are all slow and have a lower jump, so I never use them. If Mark, Chrissy, and Laura die, I usually just reset the game. At first glance, having three slow characters might seem like a waste, but it can be an interesting way to increase the difficulty if you find this game to be too easy. After choosing a character, the game starts off with an error. It tells you to light the fireplaces with the torch, when in fact you light the fireplaces with the lighter. It wants you to do this because once you've lit all the fireplaces, you'll receive the torch. As far as weapons go, you'll start with the rock, which is of course the weakest. After that, you can obtain the knife, machete, axe, pitchfork, and of course the torch. It's kind of confusing because in-game you're told that fire damages Jason the most, yet the manual states, pitchfork, the one weapon that really harms Jason. Use it to finish him off once and for all. Okay, so which is it? There are also other items to obtain, like keys, which will unlock certain cabins, notes, which give you clues, vitamins, which will automatically heal you upon death, and the flashlight, which lights up the caves. It's important to note that to make weapons and items appear, you have to kill enemies and jump around. It seems kind of odd, but the real problem is when you can accidentally pick up a weaker weapon, like if you have the torch, and then, whoops, now I have the knife. So that's kind of annoying. How about the enemies? Well, besides Jason, we have zombies, water hags, wolves, bats, and crows. Yeah, they're not from any of the movies, but I suppose this game would be too boring with only Jason. I said earlier that this game takes place over the course of three days, so think of it like three levels. And so to beat each day or level, you need to defeat Jason. The game is over when Jason kills all the kids, or kills all the counselors. As you probably assumed, each day gets harder. The monsters move faster, and so does Jason. On day one, Jason moves slow. On day three, Jason moves fast. And on day two, his speed changes between that of day one and day three. Although this only applies to when you're in cabins, as outside he always moves at the same speed. So on day three, it's best to fight him outside. As far as I can tell, Jason seems to move counterclockwise and takes every path and enters every cabin he encounters. But it seems like his starting position every playthrough is random, but I could be wrong. When Jason enters a cabin with a potential victim, you'll be alerted immediately. If you take too long to reach the aforementioned cabin, the counselor or child will be brutally murdered. Another thing to note, as you're being alerted and the time ticks, Jason will be slashing away at his victim and decreasing their life, so it's better to reach Jason sooner than later. If you catch Jason outside, you can chase him if you move to the right as soon as he runs away. Check it out.
This is ideal on days 2 and 3. You're able to switch councils on the fly. This is great to cut down on traveling time. To do this, enter a small, vacant cabin and press start. You'll be able to choose any of the living counselors and move to their cabin and take over as that character. The only issue with that is the fact that the counselors don't share weapons and items. So if you've been playing as Mark, and you have the torch and tons of vitamins, the counselor you switch to won't have any of that stuff. It's not all bad news though, as you can cure and swap weapons with other counselors, but this has to be done in person. There's also an interesting side quest. It's completely optional, but you can fight Jason's mother. You're only able to encounter her on days 2 and 3. If she's defeated on day 2, you'll obtain her sweater, which reduces the damage you take by half. This is a fantastic item and is absolutely worth it if you're up for the challenge. If you defeat her on day 3, you'll obtain the pitchfork. I find this is not worth it because the torch works perfectly fine. One thing to note is that you can fight her on both days and get both items. Jason's mother is located in the caves. It's dark in there, but you can use the flashlight to see the doors leading to other paths, but this is not necessary, as you can tell where the doors are just by the way these rocks look. So once you've killed Jason on day 3, congratulations, you've beat the game. So that's Friday the 13th for NES. It's a game that many seem to misunderstand, which, due to the flaws, is fair enough. See, back in the day, we were all used to running to the right to clear the stage, and this game is not like that at all, so no wonder why people got confused and gave up. Though if you give this game a chance, you'll see that it's actually a really neat little survival horror experience, and if you're a fan of the movie franchise like me, even better. I give Friday the 13th a 7 out of 10. Thanks for watching. What is going on? Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Man here, and today we're taking a look at Gargoyles Quest 2 for the NES. This game was developed and published by Capcom in 1992. You take control of a demon named Firebrand, and while training, your home is destroyed by a mysterious black light, and it's your job to solve the mystery. And that's where the story begins. The graphics in this game are fantastic. Just look at these levels. Lots of colors, and the environments are varied, which helps the game from getting boring. The sprites are also fantastic. Overall, this is just a great looking NES game. The music is also very well done. It is often very somber, gloomy if you will, and of course, it fits this game's setting very well. The controls are simple enough. A is jump, press A again in midair and you can hover, and B is to fire the projectile that you have selected. You also have menus you can navigate to, which show your armor, your weapons, your nails, wings, etc. The first thing I notice is how fast Firebrand moves in the overworld and villages. Right away you just zip around. That's a huge breath of fresh air. In other games, I'm used to walking at a snail's pace, like in Final Fantasy or Dragon Warrior. Both are great games, but you know, it's nice to walk fast. There are two modes of gameplay here, the overworld slash villages, and the side-scrolling platforming stages. In the overworld, this game resembles Final Fantasy or Dragon Warrior, and that's awesome. But instead of random battles and leveling up, you have platforming stages and you find items throughout the game which makes Firebrand stronger. You learn about the story, the game world, and what to do next by talking to NPCs. If you hate to read, there isn't much of it. You can get armor which increases your life meter, nails which increase your jump height, wings which increase the length of time you're able to hover, and you can acquire new weapons which all have their purpose. Like for example, this tornado. It allows you to shoot platforms which help to find and access hard to reach areas. There are other items you obtain such as vials which are currency, and maelstrom which are extra lives. There are other items as well, but they're quest items and they're usually used for just advancing the game. Now in Gargoyles Quest 2, the level designs are top notch. These levels and boss fights were designed with Firebrand's abilities in mind and it shows. When it comes to difficulty, well, this game isn't easy. Some enemies will appear at random, and if you're unlucky, they'll appear in places where it is very difficult to avoid. Also, this stage here, yeah, this jump is ridiculous. First time playing, I probably died 20 times trying to figure out how to make this jump. Like why? Why did they decide, screw you, have fun with this jump? It didn't have to be that way. Well, just so you don't have to struggle with it, I'll show you what to do. Get as close to the edge as possible and jump as high as you possibly can. And when going right, let off the hover a few times like this. Yeah, we got it. But this jump is an asshole. Now, getting back to the difficulty, it's not as hard as other games like Battletoads and Castlevania but it can still be a challenge to complete. Thankfully, this game never sets you back too far if you die, and there's also a password system so you may return later. 
So if I were to play Battletoads, I would give up after a few game overs because I just got sick of having to replay the whole game over and over again. It's nice when you receive a password, the game automatically stores it so if you die, you respawn at the last place where you obtained the password. So that asshole jump I was talking about? Well, at least I could keep trying until I got it. If you turn the game off though, you'll have to enter the password, which probably goes without saying. So that's Gargoyles Quest 2. It's a great game with impressive visuals and music and fun gameplay. If you're a game collector, well the cart isn't cheap. But if you just want to play it, I'm sure you guys can find a way. I give Gargoyles Quest 2 an 8 out of 10. Thanks for watching. Thanks for the call, Jay. You want to take a look at some Ghostbusters games? Well, let's do it. The first Ghostbusters game on the NES was released in 1988. But did you know that it was released on the Commodore 64, the Apple II, and the Sega Master System? But what about the NES version? How does it hold up? Nintendo was like the biggest thing in the mid to late 80s, so did this game live up to expectations, or were kids across the country disappointed at- who am I kidding? This game sucks. In Ghostbusters, your goal is to get into the Zool building and defeat Gozer. So how do you do that? Well, by going around the city, catching ghosts, earning money, and buying equipment. All just to catch more ghosts, earn more money, and buy better equipment until you're ready to enter the Zool building. There are a few different stage types like the driving sections, the ghost catching parts, the city map, and the stairs. Ghostbusters has variety with a somewhat open world feel to it, and for that I gotta give this game credit, but unfortunately it's not pulled off that well. The city map is your hub. First you need to buy some equipment. The game only gives a slight hint. You need a beam. Uh, thanks. So make sure you buy a beam and the super trap. Now you're ready to go to haunted buildings to catch some ghosts. After you pick a building, you then have to drive there. These driving sections seem pointless. You drive down a straight road while dodging cars and periodically running out of gas. If you hit another car, you lose money. Make sure to hit these gas cans. They give you more gas. Yeah, I don't get it. If you move to the top of the screen, you'll drive fast faster, which is good because that means you'll spend less time in the driving sections. So make sure to always drive like a maniac. You might hit a few other cars or miss a few gas cans, but either way, it's worth it. I have to say, these parts really do feel like filler. Once you make it to your destination, it's finally time to catch some ghosts. Every ghost you catch nets you some cash. The more ghosts, the more cash. You're actually on a time limit here, and it can be real annoying if you happen to not catch any ghosts considering you just sat through a pointless driving stage. You'll be repeating the driving and ghost catching stages a lot, making this game very repetitive. The majority of this game really is this and this. Have fun. Once you're ready to enter the Zool building, which by the way is only offered after you've earned $15,000, you're treated with the infamous stairs level. I really don't know what they were thinking here. You have to keep tapping the A button in order to move. This is not only tedious, but tiring. I recommend using a turbo controller. That is, if you haven't shut this game off already. The ghosts seem to move randomly. You have to have patience and time it properly. There are some items you can buy from the shop that help to alleviate the frustration, but even then, these items only help a little. Once you die here, it's game over. That means back to the beginning of the game. Man, so you did all that driving and ghost catching just for this to happen. Nice. So how about them graphics? I guess the only color they didn't run out of was gray. Man, I'm serious. This game looks awful. At least we have the Ghostbusters tune. Right? Well, I guess they decided to use the tune as much as they used the color gray. So throughout the whole game. Okay, so overall, Ghostbusters... Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend playing this. It's just not fun. Like, none of it. I've never had such little fun in my life. The graphics, the music, and the gameplay, it's all just really bland. So how about Ghostbusters 2? Did they learn from their mistakes? Is Ghostbusters 2 a better game? Ghostbusters 2 does not have a pseudo open world like the first game, and therefore it's more focused. Ghostbusters 2 still has variety, but it's handled slightly better this time around. There are three types of stages. For the run and gun stages, aiming your gun is kind of awkward. It's hard to explain, but you move it in an arc and it stays where you left it. It's not bad, it just takes some getting used to. Also, the controls are backwards. Pressing A shoots your gun, and pressing B jumps. <sighs> oh, I... I... I hate when developers reverse the controls like that. Like, have they not played another video game before? As far as the level design goes, well, there's not much here. You just walk to the left while trying to not get hit with all this crap that's getting thrown at you. There's no platforming to speak of. You just have to jump over the occasional random item. Just keep going and you'll eventually make it to the end. Next, we have the driving stage. Thankfully, these are much better than the driving stages in the first Ghostbusters game. It actually feels like a game rather than unnecessary padding. Unfortunately, the controls 
controls are still reversed here. That's actually the main reason I died. I kept pressing A to jump. Ugh, anyway. Graphically, I think these levels look great. Besides the fecal matter control, these driving sections are not too bad. There are obstacles you have to jump and ghosts you have to shoot. I kind of got annoyed at these cartoony ghosts. Why do they have to be bedsheet ghosts? Bedsheets aren't scary. Well, unless they're covered in ectoplasm. Look, I know this game was made for kids, but still, they could have come up with something less cliche. The shooter stages take place in the Statue of Liberty where you shoot up at ghosts. Reminds me a lot of Galaga. Like the driving section, this part is not bad at all. I admit, it's fun. The controls work exactly how you'd expect them to, which of course is a good thing. If I had anything negative to say, it would be that these levels drag on a little too long. And that about sums it up. Ghostbusters 2 is not what I would call a classic, but it's not a bad game at all. So do yourself a favor, skip the first game, but play the second game. Guys, I want to thank you so much. My name is Ron Man, and I'll see you next time. Back in the early 90s, the film Home Alone was a huge success. With such an unbelievably successful family movie, it made sense to game companies to take that and whip it into a video game. Now, most consoles at the time had a game titled Home Alone, but a lot of them were quite different from each other. This was because many of the different versions had different developers, which is, of course, no surprise. NES version of Home Alone was developed by Bethesda Softworks and published by THQ and released in 1991. Now, if you've been into retro gaming for a substantial length of time, you'll know that, for whatever reason, most most games published by THQ are absolute fucking garbage. I'd even go as far as to say that I prefer LJN games to THQ games. THQ fucking sucks, man. Anyway, the story of Home Alone is that Kevin McAllister has just called the police on the wet bandits. Now you have to wait 20 minutes until their arrival. In the meantime, you'll need to spend that 20 minutes avoiding both Harry and Marv. If either of them catch you, that's it. Game over. That's the whole game. No other levels. No other objectives, just run from the wet bandits for 20 minutes. Okay, so the game takes place in the McAllister house, which includes the tree house. Even though the McAllisters have an enormous house in the movie, the game world here is rather small. Of course, you play as Kevin, and as expected, you're outnumbered 2 to 1 by Harry and Marv. On top of that, they both move faster than you. So how is it that you avoid getting captured? Well, you need to pick up and set different traps. When the bandits come in contact with the trap you've set, they get knocked out for a period of time. The length by which they stay on the ground is determined by the trap you've set. Some traps keep them down longer than others. You can also hide in a few different locations, such as a bed or the Christmas tree. Although if you hide here long enough, they'll eventually find you. The graphics are laughably bad. The character sprites are diaper gravy, and look at those animations. They really do fall into the category of, they're so bad they're good. Home Alone also has a few different end screens. So here's an interesting fact, there happen to be two different versions of Home Alone. In one version, the game over screen looked like this, and the other looked like this. If you happen to have enough patience and last 20 minutes without getting captured, you get this end screen. Man, that looks like shit. Hey, check out these two screens. Did Kevin somehow get a haircut before the cops showed up? Also, the music is a shit sandwich. Just listen. I guess that kind of sounds like Run Rudolph Run. You actually get a few different tracks depending on where you are. The treehouse has its own music, as does the basement. The controls suck ass too. Walking up or down any stairs is a real bitch. It just feels super clunky. There were times where I got caught because I didn't move up or down the stairs good enough. Okay, so I mentioned that this game is 20 minutes long. Here's an honest question. Who thought that 20 minutes was a good length of time? The game world is so small, and there's really very little to do, 20 minutes feels like a lifetime to be playing this. Let's just put this into perspective. Two minutes is not a long time. But when you're doing a plank, two minutes feels like an eternity. Well, apply the same concept to Home Alone. 20 minutes isn't a long time at all, it's just an episode of a TV show. When I start watching Married with Children, 20 minutes flies by. But when you're playing Home Alone, 20 minutes feels like all day. Why couldn't they have cut it down to, say, 5 minutes and just make more levels or something? 20 minutes in this small stage is so boring. I can see what the developers were going for, and in a sense I kinda like the idea of this game, but uh, man, it didn't work out well. 
The only context that I can maybe see this game having any semblance of fun is if you have a buddy over and you each take turns to see who can last longer. But I mean, e even that's being way too generous. And that's really all there is to say about Home Alone. Have any of you guys ever lasted the full 20 minutes and beat this game? Leave it down in the comments section below. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. Merry Christmas and I'll see you in the next video. Mighty Final Fight is a beat em up that was developed and published by Capcom for the NES in 1993, making this a very late NES game. The Super Nintendo had already been out for two years. Mighty Final Fight is an original game, although its story is a retelling of the first Final Fight game released in arcades in the Super Nintendo. The Mad Gear Gang has kidnapped Hagar's daughter Jessica, and you need to get her back before the final boss, Belger, marries her. As you can tell, this game is more light-hearted. Mighty Final Fight takes place in Metro City, and there are a total of five levels, all with a few different areas and a boss fight at the end. All the levels are pretty straightforward. You just walk. Straight forward to the right. The first boss cracks me up. He asks you a couple of questions, and if you answer no, it actually causes him physical damage. So make sure you always tell him no. Not only that, but I think the dialogue in this game is really funny. You're too fat and lazy to oppose me. That hurts, you know. I walked all the way here. I'm not that lazy. Check this out. Those who offend me must die. You know, it's funny how that line is relevant even in today's culture. There are people out there who will destroy your life if you offend them. And generally they are bad people, so uh... I think this game got it right. I really like the look and feel of Metro City. All the levels are bright, colorful, and interesting to look at. I know I've mentioned this before, but I'm a big sucker for signs in video games. <laughs> this place is for sale. Who the fuck's gonna buy that? The windows are shattered and there's a street fight happening right outside. Check this out, I'm not too sure if you can make that out, but this bar opens at 10 o'clock in the morning. She must have meant 10 o'clock at night. Do you think? Why would she have you meet her in a bar at 10 in the morning? I just figured she was a raging alcoholic. Also, the music in this game is absolutely top-notch. There are three playable characters, Cody, Guy, and Hagger. All characters have unique fighting styles and stats. Hagger is the slowest, but the strongest. Guy is the fastest, yet the weakest. And Cody is right in the middle, average speed and strength. Now, these characters all feel very different from one another. If you're new to this game, you might want to take a bit of time to figure out which character suits your play style and stick with that character until you have a strong grasp of the game. I really like that all characters are vastly different because it adds so much more to replay value. With that being said, sadly this game is one player only. Mighty Final Fight is also structured like an RPG. You collect experience points upon defeating enemies. As you level up, your strength and life meter will grow. At level 4, you learn the special move associated with the character you've chosen. When you start a new game, Cody and Guy start at level 1, as expected. But for whatever reason, Hagar starts the game on level 3. It seems unusual, but I'm not complaining. Now, typically in RPGs, the amount of experience points earned is usually based on the enemies you've killed. But in Mighty Final Fight, the amount of experience earned is based on which move you use to finish the enemy off. For example, finishing off an enemy with a pile driver will net you more experience points than if you had just punched them. Enemies all have their own life meters and how much health they have is actually randomized. It's always good to punch an enemy first to see their life so you can better plan how and when you'll finish them off. Throughout Metro City, you'll come across a number of items. Any food items restore health. If you're at full health when you collect food items, it'll give you experience instead, so that's cool. Hearts give the player an extra life, a Moby gives the player two extra lives, and a bag of money gives the player a continue. You can also pick up weapons, but they work a little differently here. Each character has their own weapon. For example, if you're playing as Hagger, the only weapon you'll find is the hammer. If you're playing as Cody, the only weapon you'll find is the knife. The weapons are great and deal tons of damage, but you won't gain as much experience points as you would if you had used one of your fighting techniques instead, so keep that in mind. And really, that's all there is to say about Mighty Final Fight. It's a fast-paced beat-em-up with great graphics and music. The controls are tight and the replay value will have you coming back for more. I absolutely love this game. The cart alone goes for $317.62 Canadian or $253.55 US. Ugh. But either way, you should definitely check this game out any way you can. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate that. I know I say thank you at the end of every video. But I really do mean it. It's not just part of the uniform. I really do mean it. Please make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons, the bell notification, and I will see you guys next time. The NES Advantage is an arcade-style joystick controller made by AscuWare and released in 1987.
It's a very well-built and solid controller. Unlike a traditional controller, the NES Advantage is made to be placed on a surface, although you can have it in your lap. Instead of a D-pad, we have a joystick. We have the A and B buttons along with the start and select buttons. Because the NES Advantage takes up both controller ports, it instead has a switch to swap between the first and second players. Now I'll talk about the unique features of this controller which gives the player an advantage. An NES Advantage. Pressing the slow button causes the game to go into slow motion. There are also two turbo buttons, one each for the A and B buttons. These two dials adjust the speed of the turbo, so the real advantage is slowing the game down while you, the player, can speed up. The NES Advantage can be used with any game, but as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, the primary genre this controller was made for is shooters. Or shoot 'em ups Or shmups. Whatever you want to call them. First off, the joystick is a great fit. Playing a shooter with the D-pad can take its toll on your thumb. The joystick, however, is very comfortable. The extra features of this controller were made for these types of games. See, when you use the slow button, it actually just causes the game to rapidly pause. In 1942, when you pause, the word pause appears on the screen, so using slow motion here is just not practical. It's really more of a pseudo slow motion, but in 1943 it works great. Well, if you can handle the constant sound of the pause jingle. You can also take advantage of the turbo button so you can shoot much faster without your hand getting tired. Although in some games you're only allowed to have a certain number of bullets on screen at a time. So if that's the case, the turbo function might feel less useful. Now I've been playing shooters all week, so here are some that I think work really well with the NES Advantage. 1943, Dragon Spirit, Stinger, Gradius, Gyrus, and Section Z. Games like Pac-Man and Burger Time are also great with the NES Advantage. Although this controller doesn't offer up any tactical benefits, it does give you that arcade-like experience at home. Like I've already said, you can use the NES Advantage with any game. Although it's not ideal, playing platformers with the NES Advantage provides a pseudo-hard mode, which is funny because it's really more of an NES disadvantage at this point. Either way, games like Mario 3 and Mega Man work fine, it's just a lot to get used to. The slow motion feature is useless for these games, as is the Turbo. In Mario 3, yeah, Turbo allows you to shoot two fireballs fast, but because you can only have two on screen at any given time, it's not much help. The same can be said for all the Mega Man games. Now, now, there are some games that maybe you should avoid playing with the NES Advantage. Castlevania, for example, is not a good match. Because you have to press up along with B to use sub-weapons, it just comes off as cumbersome. You'll just wish you had a regular controller. Again, turbo and slow motion have no purpose here. But if you really want to put yourself at a disadvantage and not have fun, play Castlevania or Castlevania 3 with the NES Advantage. Heck, put on some Battletoads or Zelda 2 while you're at it. You can really ruin your night. Or you can just use the U-Force. Ugh. So that's the NES Advantage. It's a really well-made, sturdy controller with the main advantage being the ability to use slow motion and turbo. But keep in mind, it's best used with shooters, but it's also great with early arcade ports. Guys, thank you so much for watching. If you know any other games that work really well with the NES Advantage, please throw them down in the comments below. If you like this video, please hit like. If you're new here, please subscribe, and I'll see you next time. What's up, people? Ron Man here, and today we're taking a dive into a less popular beat-em-up for the NES, and that is Renegade. Renegade was developed by Technos and published by Taito in 1987. You play as Mr. K, a vigilante trying to save his girlfriend. I have to say, I love this cover art. 2 a.m. is no time to be alone on the subway, and you're about to find out why. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just, I love this. I can't get enough. <laughs> the graphics are a mixed bag. I think the environments look good. I love the look of the subway, the pier, the bar, and so on. For some reason, I love when video games have signs. Like, actual signs that you can read. This game has signs that fall into the it's so bad it's good category. Look at Beer. But not beer. B. R. It's like they started writing beer, but then ran out of room, so I don't know, put the R underneath? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it all looks pretty good. Uh, the character models, on the other hand, yeah, no. They all look pretty sloppy. For example, I love when you're grabbed from behind and kick forward. That looks like it hurts, and I don't mean the guy he's kicking. And this is the first boss. That looks terrible. So yeah, the graphics are a mixed bag. How about the music? Well, it 
it's just there. It's not bad. It's not good. It just is, and that's okay. Moving on to controls. Maneuvering around works easy enough. A is to attack to the right of you, and B is to attack to the left of you. Much like in Double Dragon 2. Pressing both A and B allows for a jump kick. When an enemy is down, you may mount and punch them. This kills the enemies pretty quick, although oftentimes other enemies will hit you off. When you're standing and punching an enemy, they'll eventually bend over, and at that point you can grab them, and you can knee and or throw them. You may also dash by double tapping left or right. While dashing, you can jump kick or punch. That all sounds simple enough, but one of the major flaws of this game is that the fighting is just not all that easy. The hitboxes just kind of seem off, and that's a problem. Approaching an enemy and attacking feels kind of like a gamble. You might hit them, they might hit you, and sometimes you both punch and you both take damage. There were even times throughout my playthrough that I mounted an opponent and my punches actually missed. It must be a glitch or something, but it did happen. Overall, it just makes the game feel hard to control, and I think a game's difficulty shouldn't be through crappy controls, but genuine challenge. Of course, if you happen to play this game a lot, you'll eventually get good at the controls. But if you look at a good beat-em-up, you'll find the game is instantly fun and the controls are not an issue. For example, Turtles in Time. It's easy to just beat things up. You don't have to be worried about approaching a foot soldier and quickly getting killed. The control in Turtles in Time is perfect. Double Dragon 2, the same thing. You don't have to worry about walking up to some thugs and hoping that you get the right of way for attacking. Anyway, I, I don't know, this is just the way I perceive the controls. Feel free to disagree. The gameplay has some weaknesses, though it does have some strengths too. One weakness is that there are only four missions. Suppose you get good enough at this game to master the controls, the game is over in a flash. In most beat-em-ups, typically you walk through a level, exploring, if you will, while beating up a bunch of assholes. In this game, you stay on the same screen until you've killed enough people. Then you move on to a different screen and continue doing the same thing. Then you get a boss. This game does have a difficulty setting. On the title screen, down here it says Level 1. This actually refers to the difficulty level. Level 1 being easy, level 2 is normal, and level 3 is hard. The game is already hard enough on level 1, I can't imagine playing it on levels 2 or 3. One strength this game has is that the time of day will change depending on what difficulty you're on. Level 1 is daytime, level 2 is dusk, and level 3 is nighttime. I think that's awesome, even though it's just a small touch. Another cool thing is that on mission 3, after beating up these women, you can actually choose which building to go into and each offers something different. Another weakness this game has is that the two-player mode is unfortunately alternating. You can't actually play together. Another strength is that in Mission 2, they try to spice up the gameplay with this motorcycle level. Although, like the rest of the game, it controls poorly. Now, I'm not that good at this game, but I'll share a tip anyway. In Mission 1 and 2, it's a good idea to try to throw guys off the subway platform and the pier, respectively. I find that after three punches, they'll bend over and you can throw them. It's kind of tough to pull off because the controls are poo-poo, but it's worth it. If that fails, the running punch is good. Standing jump kicks also do the trick. So that's Renegade. It's hard to control, it's quite short, and the character models are laughably bad. But on the plus side, I like the look of the levels, and how on mission 2 the time of day is dependent on the difficulty setting. Ultimately, Renegade just isn't that much fun. It's hard to recommend this game when there are many others which are better. I give Renegade a 4 out of 10. Thanks for watching. Rescue the Embassy mission was originally named Hostages and was released on a whole slew of platforms including the Apple II GS and the Amiga. It was developed by Infograms and the NES port was published by Chemco in 1989. A terrorist group has taken over the Embassy and you, a tactical rescue team, are sent in to save the hostages. Throughout the game, you'll play through three stages, so to speak, and they're all vastly different. The objective of Stage 1 is to place three snipers in three separate locations. At the start, you're shown a map. The X's are where your snipers need to go, and your start point is here. To get there, you just walk there. Simple, right? Well, you need to avoid the searchlights. If you're caught, the terrorists will shoot. Luckily, you can roll, go prone, and hide in the background. If you press A and B together, you'll see a map with your current position. If you get shot, you die and lose that character for the rest of the game. So even if you only manage to get one sniper in position, you'll still move on to the next level. If all your guys die though, it's game over. 
The idea here is that you should have one sniper at each side of the building to maximize coverage. So depending on how many snipers you lose will determine how many sides of the building you can shoot at in the next stage. At the beginning of stage 2, you're shown a cutscene of your rescue team landing on top of the building via helicopter. You can switch between your snipers and your rescue team by pressing select. When sniping, you can look through the scope of your rifle as you try to take out as many terrorists as you can. You have to be quick though because they move around. Each side of the building has 9 windows. The more terrorists you snipe here will affect how many your rescue team will have to deal with once inside the embassy. In the final stage of the game, your rescue team will have to repel into the building. Fun fact, this is actually my first and only video game appearance. Yep, that's me, Ron. Once inside, the game will look quite similar to other Chemco published games like Shadowgate or Uninvited. Your objective here is to shoot the terrorists, but don't shoot the hostages. Be careful because the terrorists move around and can sneak up on you. The heads up display here is super helpful. The map is easy to understand and you can see how many terrorists are on each floor. The green dots are terrorists and the blue dots are hostages, although in the higher difficulties, the map doesn't show you these. Once all the terrorists are dead, well, congratulations, you beat the game. At the end, you're shown a screen explaining the outcome. Unfortunately, this game is pretty short, quite possibly the shortest NES game. However, Rescue the Embassy Mission does have replay value. When you first turn the game on, you have a number of options, all of which change the difficulty. First, you select either Lieutenant, Captain, or Commander, so easy, medium, or hard, respectively. The higher the level, the greater number of searchlights and the quicker the enemy. Then you pick your mission. Of course, training is the easiest and Jupiter is the hardest. Now, this is confusing because the mission doesn't actually change, which I think is kind of a bummer. Instead, which mission you pick just determines certain variables. The variables affected are the speed of searchlights, the number of enemies, your accuracy, and lastly, your overall time limit. So yeah, this is a really short game, but with these options, you can challenge yourself and really extend the playtime. There is a bit of a learning curve, but overall, this is a really good pick-up-and-play video game. If you have, say, a half hour before going to work, instead of scratching your scrotum, you can play Rescue the Embassy Mission, which I give a 7 out of 10. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate that. I want to know, do you know of any other NES games that are shorter than this game? Guys, please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you next week. When it comes to beat-em-ups for the NES, there are many options, but none are quite as unique as River City Ransom. Many things separate this game from its contemporaries, such as collecting and spending money, leveling up your stats, and the fact that this game is kind of non-linear, meaning that you can go back and forth between screens. What's up guys, Ron Man here, and today we're taking a stroll through the beautiful River City as we review River City Ransom for the NES. You take control of Ryan or Alex, beating up a plethora of gang members with the ultimate goal of saving Ryan's girlfriend from the gang lord Slick. The graphics are pretty well done. The characters have a charming, cartoony look to them, and I think the environments and backgrounds also look great. The music is awesome. Throughout the game, you hear 50s-style rock and roll along with some other tunes. Sound effects are satisfying as you beat down members of various gangs. The controls are well done. A is to punch, B is to kick. Pressing both A and B together will allow you to jump, and double tapping left or right in that direction will allow you to run. Like all beat-em-ups, you'll spend a lot of time fighting. There are many weapons you may obtain, like lead pipes, sticks, although that looks more like a knife, chains, trash cans, crates, tires, brass knuckles, rocks, and lastly, you can actually pick up enemies and swing around or throw them. You encounter many different gangs, and luckily, they're all color-coded. For example, the frat guys are pink, and the cowboys are blue. There are a total of nine different gangs, and their difficulties vary. As you defeat enemies, they will drop money, and this is essential, as you'll need to buy different foods and beverages to increase your stats. Speaking of stats, there are many to consider. Punch, kick, weapon, throwing, agility, defense, strength, willpower, stamina, and max power. Some of these stats are self-explanatory, but some are not. For example, stamina refers to your health meter, and willpower refers to your ability to revive, so to speak. Going back to spending money, there is a huge list of shops such as bookstores, coffee shops, bread shops, drug stores, fast food restaurants, sushi restaurants, and shoe stores. There are tons of items you can spend your money on throughout the various shops, and I can't possibly cover everything in this video, but most items will increase your stats in some way. Throughout River City, you'll discover many locations such as shopping malls, parks, and warehouses, just to name a few. The game's finale occurs in River City High School. 
But in order to get there, you need to defeat all the gang bosses, at least the bosses outside the school. Once defeated, the boss will give you a clue as to where the next boss is located. Another great thing about River City Ransom is its two-player co-op, though there is noticeable lag. You also don't have to beat this game in one sitting either, as there is a password option. Unfortunately, it's a really long and tedious password, but it's sure better than nothing. As awesome as this game is, I do have a few nitpicks. For one, sometimes when you enter a new area, an enemy will immediately attack you. You have no time to react. It's kind of cheap. Also, when you die, you lose half your money. So it's kind of annoying when you're saving up to buy something expensive, and after getting your ass handed to you a couple times, you'll have nothing more than pocket change. Can't even buy a drink from the tea bag. Before I offer my score of this game, I'll share a few tips. Upon starting a new game, the first thing you should do is purchase either Stone Hands or Dragon Feet from the bookstore. This item will allow you to punch or kick rapidly. It'll give you an edge in combat. Remember that for those items, you'll need to press Start and press A on Belongings and read the book to learn the technique. It's important to note that each gang offers a set amount of money each time you defeat a member. For example, the generic dudes always drop 50 cents. You'll get more money for defeating more difficult gangs. That being said, bosses always drop more money than typical gang members. Early in the game, you'll encounter the boss duo Benny and Clyde. These guys aren't too tough, and since bosses always respawn, it's a great way to farm for cash as both of these Emmy Award winners offer 250 each. Later in the game, after you've accrued enough money, you should make your way to Happy Feet Shoes located in the Flatirons Mall and buy the Texas Boots. This along with the Dragon Feet will make you a powerhouse. So that's River City Ransom. It's one of the best beat-em-ups on the NES, and I highly recommend you play it. It's also available on the Nintendo Switch's online service. I give River City Ransom a 9 out of 10. Thanks for watching. Nostalgia. Just saying that word can oftentimes be enough just to make us smile. Taking a moment to think about the past can be so satisfying. A lot of us feel nostalgic for video games we grew up playing, and when that nostalgia hits us in the face, it's one of the best feelings. Video games and nostalgia always seem to go hand in hand. When you go back and play the exact game you played when you were younger, it's still the same. It hasn't changed. Video games can feel like time capsules. For me, Shadowgate is no different. This game was in my house before I can even remember. I often tried to play it, even before I could read. But once I was able to read somewhat competently, that's when I was able to actually submerge myself into the world of Shadowgate. A few years later, my mom introduced me to Deja Vu, another point-and-click adventure game in the same vein as Shadowgate. It wasn't until my early 20s that I discovered Uninvited, and I don't know how I went so long without knowing about this game. I love Shadowgate and consider it to be the quintessential point-and-click adventure game. For that reason, I thought it'd be neat to take a look at a few different versions of the original game. Because this is a puzzle-heavy game, I'm going to try to limit how many puzzle solutions I reveal. So first, I'll go over the story. The story goes a little something like this. Long ago, a great council of sorcerers existed, the Circle of Twelve. One from that group of mighty wizards fell into the Black Arts. He was forever named the Warlock Lord, and sought to subjugate the people of Cal Torlin. However, the remaining members of the Circle, led by the powerful Lakemere the Timeless, succeeded in imprisoning the Evil One in a deep cavern below Castle Shadowgate. Centuries passed, and the land enjoyed peace and prosperity as the Warlock Lord bided his time deep below. An unfortunate accident, triggered by a group of dwarves, released the evil from his magical cell. Seizing control of Castle Shadowgate, the Warlock Lord turned his control towards summoning the mighty titan, the Behemoth. With this powerful creature at his side, the Warlock Lord would be unstoppable. Only someone from the ancient line of kings, of which the prophecies speak of, can stand against this evil. Only a hero descended from the lost royal family can bring ruin to the Warlock Lord's dark schemes. That hero is you. Will you accept the task of freeing Shadowgate Castle from the clutches of the evil Warlock Lord and prevent his plans for revenge? <coughs> Shadowgate was originally released in 1987 for the Apple Macintosh. Well, this is it, the very first version. As you can see, it's in black and white. I don't mind the look, although sometimes it can be hard to figure out what you're supposed to be looking at, or where your attention is supposed to be drawn. Still though, it gets the job done, and I think it's kinda neat. This version also has no music, just the occasional sound effect. 
I don't see this as a bad thing, just different. As you can see, you have many different actions at your disposal. You use these to explore the castle, solve puzzles, and avoid traps. I love examining the environment. By doing this, Shadowgate paints a bigger picture of where you are and can either suggest a hint or provide backstory. Sometimes it'll just give you a general description of what you're looking at, and to me, this really helps to immerse the player. Sometimes there's even humor thrown in. I think it's cool that you can rearrange the windows and even change their size. Your inventory has a limited capacity despite being able to make it bigger. This means you'll need to drop items when you think you won't need them anymore. You're also going to want to collect as many torches as you can. They act as a sort of time limit. If your torch goes out, you'll need to restart or reload, and luckily, you can do this at any time. When your torch is almost dead, the game will notify you. It can be easy to miss, however, as there's no audio cue when this occurs. Just text. Also, be ready with a notepad. When you discover spells, you need to keep track of them yourself, as this version doesn't do that for you. To use a spell, you click Speak, then type the name of the spell, and then click on the object on which you'd like to cast the spell. Even though there's no music or color, it's still a fun playthrough and a great way to experience Shadowgate. About a year later, on the Apple II GS, a colorized version of Shadowgate was released. It's mostly the same game, but with color, duh, and some new sound effects. Both of these versions can be purchased on Steam. In fact, you can buy the whole Mac Venture series for under $10. Shadowgate was ported to the NES in 1989. Like many of us, this is the version that I played first. The NES version has color and, for the first time, music. The music is fantastic too, and I think it adds a lot to the atmosphere. There's also some other quality of life improvements as well. The inventory space is now unlimited and is nicely displayed as a list. Some items will be discarded automatically when you no longer need them, like keys, for example. Spells are now saved into your spell inventory, so no need to write them down manually. When your torch is running out, the music changes to alert you. The only drawback of this version is not having a mouse, but to be honest, the D-pad seems fine to me. This version has all the same content the original has, minus one thing. The Goblin Room. I looked around the internet to find out more information, but I eventually decided to reach out to one of the developers via email, and to my surprise, I got a response. Turns out they cut the Goblin Room out of the NES version because of cartridge space. Of all the rooms in the game, the Goblin Room was chosen for removal because it wasn't integral for the game's story. It was just another way for you to die. But I think part of the fun is finding out how to die and reading the gloomy descriptions of your final moments. In 1999, two Shadowgate games were released. Shadowgate 64, Trials of the Four Towers, and Shadowgate Classic for the Game Boy Color. Shadowgate Classic is very much the NES version, but with slightly nicer graphics and, because of the smaller screen, a different display. This version is perhaps a little easier because you're able to bring up hints by pressing select. When porting console games to handheld systems, sometimes the reduced screen size can ruin the game. Thankfully, that's not the case here. Shadowgate is still great on a small screen. And that's all there really is to say about Shadowgate Classic. It's mostly the NES version. Shadowgate for the Game Boy Color also does not contain the Goblin Room. Fast forward to 2014, Shadowgate emerges from the shadows, completely reimagined. Originally released on PC, it was later ported to Xbox One, PS4, Nintendo Switch, and iOS. I'll be playing this on Nintendo Switch. Shadowgate looks completely different, and I think the new art direction is absolutely beautiful. You're now able to choose your difficulty, and whether or not to turn on hints. This is nice, especially for new players. They've added so much more to this. New locations, items, puzzles, monsters, and of course, new ways to die. A lot of the returning puzzles even have different solutions, even if the difference is minimal. The other versions of Shadowgate are mostly the same game. If you've beat it on NES, for example, you've pretty much beat it on Game Boy Color as well. Although this is still Shadowgate, these changes and improvements truly make this feel like a new game. So that's just a glimpse into the history of Shadowgate. If you're new to the series and are interested, I would recommend starting out with the 2014 version just because the visuals, the hint system, and the difficulty settings, although you can't go wrong with any version. You can download the 8-bit Adventure Anthology Volume 1 on Steam, PS4, and Xbox One, and this includes the NES versions of Shadowgate, Deja Vu, and Uninvited. 
For me, my favorite is the NES version. I just love the music, the graphics, and going back in time. Perhaps it's just the nostalgia slapping me in the face. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. Please hit that like button, please subscribe, and I'll see you next week. Solstice is an adventure puzzle game developed by Software Creations and published by CSG ImageSoft for the NES in 1990. You take control of the wizard Shaddix as he attempts to rescue Princess Eleanor from this jackass. Then you're thrust into a world of isometric adventure. As you can imagine, the perspective can take a little while to get used to. Sometimes it's hard to tell where you are in relation to your environment. For example, I can't really tell where I'm going to land if I jump off this here platform. So I jump and hope for the best. I survived. Good. The graphics of Solstice are just okay. They get the job done. The rooms do look kind of bland, but considering the type of game this is, that's okay because you don't want super busy environments. At least I wouldn't. The animation is really quite lacking. Like when you jump, well there's no animation at all. You just go up and then down. Although the music isn't great, I think it fits the game perfectly. You don't want busy music while you're trying to think. In order to save Princess Eleanor, you'll need to assemble the staff. Six pieces of it are scattered throughout this puzzle-filled labyrinth and collecting them is your main objective. There's quite a lot of platforming and considering the isometric viewpoint, this can really be a challenge. You'll need to explore, find items, and avoid enemies and obstacles. It's very possible to get lost in this huge maze, but thankfully there's a map. Just press select. Although the controls can take a little while to get used to, they're quite simple. A is jump, and B is pick up item. You can pick up blocks and drop them. You can even do this in mid-air and use the block again as a platform. This is often used to get to higher places or jump larger gaps. You have four potions which all provide different benefits. Blue makes you invincible. Green reveals hidden platforms, purple kills all enemies on screen, and yellow freezes enemies and blocks. 1-ups come in the form of wizard hats, and obtaining them usually requires skill. There are no passwords or save feature in Solstice. Every time you pop this sucker in, you play from the beginning. Considering this is a run-based game, I don't see this as a bad thing. To me, it's not so much about beating Solstice, it's just about beating your previous playthrough or run. At the game over screen, they tell you how many rooms you visited and your percentage. So for your next run, just try to beat your previous record all the while trying to iron out a good route. You can collect tokens and these allow you to continue after a game over. The location you restart at depends on where you found the token. So that's all there really is to say about Solstice. It doesn't look the best, but it's a great action puzzle game, especially once you get used to that perspective. As far as adventure puzzle games go, I give Solstice a 7 out of 10. The cartridge can usually be found for $15 or less, and Solstice actually had a sequel on the Super Nintendo called Equinox. I haven't played much of Equinox, but we'll get to it one day. Guys, I want to thank you so much again for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you next week. Star Tropics was developed by Nintendo R&D 3 and published by Nintendo in North America in 1990 and later on in Europe in 1992. It's a single-player action-adventure game where you take control of young Mike Jones on his quest to save his uncle in the tropical South Seas. The game is divided up into chapters and has a mostly linear progression. Star Tropics has two modes of play, the overworld and the dungeons. While in the overworld, you explore the islands and villages, pilot the submarine with Rob the Robot, how cool is that, and talk to NPCs. At the beginning of the game, you land on Sea Island and make your way to the first village. After a meeting with the village chief, it's explained to you that your uncle has been abducted. So he tells you to find a tunnel and make your way to your uncle's laboratory. Okay, cool. Well, here I am. Who are you? Stay away from here? Dude, I'm in a hurry to save my uncle. Get the fuck out of the way. Turns out, you need to talk to every single villager before this guy lets you in. This is a quirk of Star Tropics because this isn't the only time this happens. Later on, you get to a village and you find out the chief's daughter is sick. The chief asks you to help, you say yes, and when you try to leave to progress, this guy's like, Whoa, dude, you gotta talk to the chief's daughter. God, jeez, oh, fuck, okay, fine. So you walk your ass all the way over there, run up the stairs, and they're all like, Yeah, she's sick. Yeah, I fucking knew that already, I talked to the chief. The chief's daughter is actually sleeping, so you don't even talk to her. Now this guy lets you leave. What's the point of that, exactly? The meat and potatoes of Star Tropics, however, are the dungeons. This is where you engage the enemies in combat, and your goal is to kill the boss and or make your way out to the other side. 
Your primary weapon is a yo-yo, but along the way you'll pick up sub-weapons, spells, and potions. Everything besides the yo-yo has limited use. The dungeons all have good design and the difficulty pacing is really well done. The first few dungeons are pretty straightforward, just kill things and keep moving. As the game progresses, so too does the difficulty. Not only do the enemies get stronger, but you'll have to solve puzzles as well and they too can get quite challenging. For example, in one of the earlier dungeons, there's a dark room where you have to study the enemy movements to figure out where it's safe to jump. Later in the game, everything is much more aggressive and there's less room to breathe. It's one thing after another, and it's awesome. The challenge, however, is not always fair. Sometimes you may stumble into a trap and die. It's not enough to ruin the game, but to add insult to injury, when you die, you lose your potions, your spells, and your sub-weapons. Thankfully, most dungeons have checkpoints, but if you get a game over, you'll have to restart the dungeon, but even that's not a big deal. One criticism of Star Tropics is that most dungeons have the same aesthetic, meaning they all kind of look the same. Most, but not all. Later in the game, you explore ancient ruins, and at the very end of the game, well, I don't want to spoil it, but just know that you explore a very different type of dungeon. Star Tropics is a well-made game with lots of neat touches. In Dungeon 2, your goal is to save a baby dolphin. Right before the boss fight in a watery prison cell, you can actually see the dolphin. He sees you. Hope has been restored for him. Once you take a leap into the dreaded boss room, he watches as you lay the beat down on this loser. I just always thought that was so cool. Like, I feel like I'm actually fighting for something here. The overall goal of Star Tropics is to save Mike's uncle, yeah, but here it just feels more, I don't know, tangible. I absolutely love this. Some of the bosses also have some inventive designs. In the Lava Dungeon boss fight, you don't just shove your foot up the boss's ass. You actually have to search for and jump on switches to destroy his platform which drops him into the water below. These touches give the game charm and also helps it to feel fresh throughout. Lastly, there's not much to say about the music. Other than it's fantastic. So there you go, Star Tropics is a fantastic action platformer with great music, fun dungeons, neat bosses, and tons of charm. With that being said, I give Star Tropics an 8 out of 10. I want to thank you guys for taking time out of your day to watch my content. It really does mean a lot to me. Please hit that like button, please subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video. I'm a huge fan of the original Star Tropics. I've been playing it since I was a young child. Throughout my life, I've played that game at least a dozen times from start to finish. I always thought it was sad that it never got a sequel. Well, fast forward many years later, and in my early 20s, I was surprised to see that Star Tropics did get a sequel. The title of that sequel is Zoda's Revenge, Star Tropics 2. Yeah, Star Tropics 2 is the subtitle. Now, I'm sure there is a reason for this, but I just can't help but think that that was a stupid choice. When I was a broke teenager, I actually remember browsing ROM lists and seeing Zoda's Revenge, but I never did check it out. Had it said Star Tropics 2, I would have loaded up that ROM immediately. In my ignorant opinion, the game ought to have been titled Star Tropics 2, with Zoda's Revenge being the subtitle. Anyway, Star Tropics 2 was developed by Nintendo R&D 3 and published by Nintendo for the NES in March of 1994. The story picks up where the first game left off. You play as Mike Jones. During the opening cutscene, it's revealed that Mike and his uncle, Dr. Jones, live in Seattle. Dr. Jones is trying to decipher a puzzle. An Argonian princess named Micah contacts Mike telepathically to help him solve the problem. 
problem. Once they read out loud the cipher, Mike Jones is whisked away and the game begins. In a nutshell, the main objective to your journey is to recover all of the tetrads, which I'm sure you can tell are Tetris pieces. Star Tropics 2 is much the same as its predecessor, but also looks to improve on many of the original game's flaws. One of the criticisms of the first Star Tropics was that because the majority of the game took place in the tropics, each area and dungeon were too similar, thus leading some players to feel bored of the adventure. While I don't have this problem with the original Star Tropics, I can understand why other players would. To fix this issue, the story of Star Tropics 2 now focuses on time travel. For each chapter of the game, Mike is sent to a different time period, each of which has its own theme which allows for different locations, characters, and enemies. Because the story is centered around time travel, you'll never know where the next chapter will take you. And on that note, I'll try not to spoil too much of the adventure. The story is lighthearted and even sometimes quite goofy, even more so than the original. For example, when you meet Cleopatra in Egypt, her biggest concern is that the pizza she ordered hasn't arrived yet. So she sends you, someone she's never met before, to get her pizza, a food that did not exist back then. Shortly after you set off, you'll find the delivery man and he just so happens to be riding a red Koopa Troopa. Alright, so we have a Tetris and a Super Mario Brothers reference. There are other references as well, but I'll leave that for you to discover. But I think that's really neat. Anyway, he gives you the pizza for you to bring back to Cleopatra. Once the pizza has been delivered, she's happy to help you find the Tetrad. There are also many interactions that seem irrelevant and or inconsequential. For example, later on in the game while you're in London, the police arrest you because you're standing outside. Yeah, I mean you're not committing any crimes. They've just arbitrarily decided that you look suspicious, so they lock you up in a cell that just so happens to have an easy to find escape route and you can just walk out. Like why is this a thing? Basically, for each chapter you just have to help the people with their simple problem to get the tetrad, then move on. Overall, the story is as thin as toilet paper, but a nice trade-off is that at least you don't get bogged down by too much text. Alright, let's take a look at the difficulty and controls. In my opinion, Star Tropics 2 gets off to a bit of an uneven start. Alright, so the very first challenge is making your way through this snowy field. Sounds simple, right? But there are many pitfalls that you cannot see coming. If you fall, you'll have to fight your way back out. It's not hard, but it seems a bit strange that this is your first obstacle. In the first major dungeon, about halfway through, there's a maze where you have to continue to select the correct door. If, at any point, you select the wrong door, you get sent back out of the dungeon and you have to restart from the beginning. It turns out, this pattern on the wall inside the first town is the order in which you pick the doors. But on your first playthrough, how would you know that? Again, it just seems like another odd choice for the very first area of the game. As for the controls, they're made a lot more fluid. You're able to move in all eight directions and it feels pretty good. However, this fluidity comes at a cost. Because you're no longer locked into a grid, it's now much easier to miss your jumps. Therefore, the platforming in Star Tropics 2 is a lot more challenging. Also, you don't have any iframes, so even a small enemy can drain your health in seconds. And on top of that, Mike generally takes a lot of damage. It seems like the majority of enemies later in the game will take two or three hearts off your health each time they hit you, so it's very easy to die. And each time you die, you lose everything. Any extra items like potions or invincibility stars are gone, as well as extra weapons. They all get removed every time you die. When you respawn, you start with only five hearts. At least you get to start at the most recent checkpoint. However, if you game over, you lose lose everything and go back to the beginning of the dungeon. Some dungeons don't even have checkpoints, so a regular death has the same punishment as a game over. To sum it up, you can die very easily and the punishment for death can be quite costly depending on where you are in the game. Ultimately, Star Tropics 2 can be a very frustrating game. Although, as frustrating as it may be, Star Tropics 2 is still a great time. The dungeons are fun to navigate and many of the boss fights are a highlight. Several of these bosses incorporate other elements to provide a unique encounter. There's a boss where you constantly need to hop around on platforms that disappear after a short time. It's not easy, but I thought it was pretty fun. There's also the fight against the knight where you're on a circular, fast-moving track. I'll leave it at that just because I don't want to spoil anything further, but trust me, the boss fights in this game are quite fun. Also, each time period in town is fun to explore. Star Tropics 2 is a linear game, but there are missable items like large heart containers, so make sure to look everywhere. The sound and the music are also pretty well done. I don't 
don't like the music as much as I like the music in the original Star Tropics, but it is still good. <laughs> However, one thing that drove me crazy is the low life alarm. Check it out. So that's about all I have to say about Star Tropics 2. I like it a lot, and if you liked the first Star Tropics, there's a good chance that you'll also like Star Tropics 2. I don't like it as much as the first game, but that's just me. I do find it a little bit more frustrating, and I don't like the music quite as much. That being said, I give Star Tropics 2 a 7 out of 10. Thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know down in the comments what your opinion of Star Tropics 2 is, and I'll see you in the next video. Supercars is a top view racing game developed by Magnetic Fields and published by Electro Brain Corporation for the NES in 1991. Supercars was also released on the Commodore 64, Atari ST, and a few other platforms. Now I'm just gonna get to the point, this is a good racing game. The graphics are decent, the controls work, and the music, well, I found myself headbanging while I was recording gameplay footage. Supercars is a lot like Micro Machines, except in this game you earn money and can spend it on a whole bunch of things. This here is the main screen. You can check out these cars down here and view their stats. Once you have enough money, you can go into the dealership and buy one of them. You can also go to the garage and buy upgrades for the car you currently have, much like in other games like Super Off-Road or Rock and Roll Racing. You can buy missiles, turbocharge, power steering, a high speed kit, you get the idea. Once you're ready to go, you can select any race you want from this list here. There are oil spills and water slicks that you'll have to contend with. If you get stuck under a bridge and can't tell which direction you're facing, press the select button. If you have missiles, you can shoot them forward or backward by pressing up and B or down and B respectively. You can earn money by winning races, which I'm sure you already assumed. Obviously coming in first is the most ideal, as you'll earn the most amount of money, which is $20,000. Coming in second or third is also fine, but if you come in fourth place or lower, you'll get a game over. In supercars, you'll also have to spend money to fill up the gas tank, change out the tires, and repair the body and engine. You keep track of these four categories by the meters displayed at the bottom of the screen. As you can imagine, these are essential and will need to be tended to usually after every race. If you don't, well, you'll lose like I did here. You are one pathetic loser. <laughs> Supercars is a lot of fun, but one drawback this game has is that there's not a lot of variety in the track selection. Here are a few different tracks. Although they're all laid out differently, you'll notice that they all have the same theme and aesthetic. Don't get me wrong, I think they look good, and there are some neat touches, like how they placed a cafe right in the middle of the racetrack. Who has time to stop for a coffee? And even if they did, where would they park? But yeah, I can understand how this might make the game feel dull, especially compared to a game like Micro Machines. Price charting has supercars listed at just over over $42 Canadian, which in my opinion is not a bad price. Definitely check this one out. What's up gamers, Ronman here. Today we're taking a look at The Rocketeer for the NES. The Rocketeer is based off of the movie with the same name. It was developed by Ironwind Software and published by Bandai in North America in 1991. Now, just throwing this out there, I have not seen the movie, therefore I won't compare how closely this game follows the movie, and I may criticize this game in some aspects and you might say, well, that's how it was in the movie. Fair enough but I'm judging the Rocketeer off its ability to stand as a competent game on its own. With that being said, is it another shameless garbage movie game cash grab, or is it a hidden gem? Let's jump into it. This game has cutscenes to tell its story, and even has a cutscene when you die. Between each level, you're treated to another cutscene to further advance the plot. That's pretty cool, especially for an NES game. Does this game's story follow the movie? I have no idea. What is this game's story? I still have no idea. I cared so little that I couldn't have been bothered to pay attention to the cutscenes or look it up. But are we here for the story of the game? No. Getting into the graphics. The graphics are well done, both sprites and backgrounds. There's not much to say in this department. It's pretty good looking. The music is there, nothing special. Nothing that'll get stuck in my head. But it's okay, the sound effects are sufficient. 
Controls here are standard fare. A is jump and B is attack. Alright, jumping into gameplay now. The Rocketeer is a side-scrolling action game with minimal platforming. Generally, you just walk to the right while killing enemies. I will say that some stages will have you moving up and back and forth. Throughout a stage, you may pick up ammo, and then you'll have many weapons at your disposal which you may cycle through at any time using the select button. The weapons included are the pistol, tommy gun, triple gun, grenades, and the bazooka. All guns use the same ammo, they just use a different amount per shot. For example, the pistol uses one bullet, but has limited range. The tommy gun uses two bullets per shot, but they fire faster and further. The triple gun uses, you guessed it, three bullets per shot, but the shots will spread out. The grenades use five bullets, and the bazooka uses a whopping 15 bullets per shot. If you have no ammo, you may punch things. Occasionally you'll pick up hearts which refill a small amount of health. There's even a rare purple heart item which refills all of your health. There's even a mega ammo item that you can find which adds 20 bullets. On certain stages, you may also pick up jetpack fuel. This allows you to use your jetpack, which sounds cool, but it's not implemented well, meaning that it doesn't add much to the gameplay and it's kind of hard to control. There are very specific places where you are to use your jetpack. I think this game would have been better if you could use your jetpack in every stage and use it to explore, which would help open this game up. They could have used this mechanic to really spice up the level design, but alas, you only use it when the game wants you to. Now that we're on the topic of level design, yeah, it's not that good. Most levels are very straightforward. There are not that many types of adversaries, and the most common are these gunners and these asshole surprise gunners. I hate these guys. They can often jump out at you with no warning. How annoying and it's nearly every stage. They tend to come out of doorways like these, although that's not always the case. Sometimes they jump out of unexpected places, like this. Some enemies are located in such spots that it's difficult to hit them like this. Level 1 is blah. It's kind of long and ends up with a silly boss fight. I couldn't figure out what to do at first. I had some jetpack fuel and some ammo, so I thought I'd fly up and try to shoot this guy, but it didn't work. So I ran out of fuel, and have to farm more out of these black suit gunners who jump out of the helicopter. So I shoot the plane, nothing happens. So I fly back up where I was shooting before, and I try again, and suddenly it worked this time. Why not before? This boss is annoying because you have to perfectly shoot him in the face, and it's not exactly easy to pull off. It also doesn't help that I keep running out of fuel and occasionally ammo too. Eventually I do take this guy down. In level 2 you go through houses and streets. It's rather nice to look at, but watch how these stages end. Abruptly. I was also surprised to see that there isn't a level 2 boss. It just ends abruptly. Now, if I liked this game, I would see this as a negative. Imagine playing Mega Man, and at the end of the stage you just warp out with no boss fight. That would suck. But in the Rocketeer, I was happy to just keep moving along. And that is not the mark of good game design. I have a real problem with stage 4, so I start playing through this level and keep taking damage. There are not many health refills, but I keep going. See, I get to this part, and I only have this much health left. So I die, and guess what? They start you back at the beginning of the whole level. Why? Other stages have checkpoints, not this stage. So I play through it again, and again take damage because guys in black suits have to surprise me. See, they come out of these doors, but not every door, just some doors. It's hard to remember which doors they jump out of. And these bombs are annoying. They're easy to deal with, but very particular. When they launch, they'll split apart when they've reached the same altitude as your head. So you just wait for them to split apart, then duck. It's easy, except sometimes I duck just a bit too early and then get shot in the head. So I painfully slog through this level and again get back to this part, and again with only this much health. I inevitably die. So back to the beginning we go, and it's at this part where I start to wonder why I'm even playing this game. I swear the urge to turn this off at this point is so strong. Also, notice when you die, you lose all ammo and jetpack fuel. That's nice. Also, I noticed, when you've completed a stage, they don't refill your health for the next stage. Why? Thankfully, you have unlimited continues, but this begs the question, why not just refill my health? It's a minor complaint, but still kind of stupid. One good thing about this game is that between every level, they give you a password so you may return later, although I don't know why you'd want to. So there you have it. This game looks good, and the controls are okay. It's certainly not as bad as other games based off of movies. And I know you guys know this, but a game designed well is the type of game you enjoy spending time with. You enjoy seeing its environments and listening to its music. 
It's a world where you enjoy returning to over and over. It's the type of game you enjoy talking about and just thinking about. Unfortunately, The Rocketeer is not that. This might sound odd, but even worse, it's not even memorable for bad reasons. Even bad games are fun to laugh at. The Rocketeer is just mediocre and forgettable. It's certainly not a bad game, but it's not good either. It's painfully average, and for that, I give The Rocketeer a 5 out of 10. Thanks for watching. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was developed by Konami and published by Konami under Ultra for the NES in 1989. It's primarily a side-scrolling action platformer, though there are some top-down sections as well. Now this game really doesn't need any introduction. It's pretty notorious. If you think this game sucks, well, you're not wrong. This game has a lot of issues that can turn gamers off, but TMNT also has a lot of strengths. To start things off, I think the music is great, even though it's not from the show. I also think the graphics are well done, despite all the flicker. But everything looks like how I think it should on the NES. A lot of what you'd see in the cartoon is here as well, such as Bebop, Rocksteady, April, Splinter, Shredder, Mousers, and the Technodrome. I do feel like the TMNT universe is well represented here, so what is the problem with this game? Now I'm going to go through everything in a little more detail, but in a nutshell, TMNT is way too rough around the edges and a little too rigid. Ultimately, this makes the game too difficult for the wrong reasons. As soon as you start the game, you can press start for the sub-menu. You can swap between each turtle at any point in time, and they each wield their respective weapon and have their own life bar. Probably one of the first things you'll notice is that it's very easy to die. As you can imagine, this makes the game really frustrating. Oftentimes, there are enemies everywhere, and this is made worse when they respawn, which happens all the time. Getting hit can cause significant damage depending on the enemy. You also don't seem to have many iframes, so if you get surrounded, you may be done for. There's also some platforming sections that seem impossible. The jump mechanic, which I'll explain in a little bit, takes a bit of getting used to. So couple silly platforming with respawning enemies, and there's a chance that at some point, you'll want to smash your controller. There are sub-weapons, and they all seem to be pretty useful, though I find it annoying that when you pick one up, it's automatically assigned. Sometimes enemies drop them, and if you're surrounded by them, you could pick it up without even knowing it. And now your sub-weapon is equipped, and you're not ready for it. This can cause problems. Really frustrating problems. If you get close to dying, it's wise to change to a different turtle who has more health. If you die, that turtle is considered captured, and you'll need to restart from the beginning of the level with your remaining turtles and whatever health they still have. If you lose all your turtles, it's game over, though you do have three continues. Instead of one-ups, it's possible that you'll come across your captured comrades and return them to your party. When you beat a stage, you continue on to the next, with the same life and remaining turtles. Ugh. Now, I can understand not giving me back my captured turtles, but why can't you just refill my health? Now, these problems are exacerbated by the level design. Most of the stages are somewhat open world, meaning that there are many buildings and sewers you can choose to explore. You do need to make it to a particular place in order to beat the stage and move on, but as a casual player, you're not going to know where this is. You're more likely to end up wandering around aimlessly while getting your ass handed to you. Another issue are the controls. Now I think they're good, but it takes a lot of time and understanding of how this game works, which brings me to the rigidity. You need to play how this game wants you to, and if you don't, you will be punished. There are very specific ways to handle each situation. It also doesn't help that the turtles each play a little differently and are not well balanced. Donatello is, by far, the best turtle here. He's the strongest and has the best range. Leo, Mike, and Raph, unfortunately, kinda suck. This game also has a hidden mechanic. When you're at 50% health or below, each turtle will get a boost in damage output. But not Raph. I'm not really too sure why this is. So you're gonna want to use Don primarily. If you lose him, good fucking luck. I only use the other turtles as damage sponges for certain sections where I'm likely to get hurt a lot, like the dam. So with all those things considered, it's no surprise that gamers don't look fondly over this title. But if you fight through the growing pains enough to get good at this game, it becomes a lot of fun. Nailing certain jumps and destroying your enemies without taking too much damage can be immensely satisfying, and trust me, it is possible. Once you're good at this game, most of the frustrations from playing this casually are removed, and as a result, you're left with a pretty solid TMNT game. Now, I'm no expert, but before I wrap up, I'll share just a few tips that might help you on your playthrough. Number one, the jump mechanics. You have three types of jumps. If you just tap A, you'll do a small jump. If you press and hold A for about a second, you'll do a medium jump. And finally, pressing and holding A throughout your whole jump will give you a large jump. 
These jumps were all used in different places. For example, in the sewer on stage 3, a small jump is perfect for jumping these gaps. Number 2. Pizzas respawn if you exit the building or sewer. There are a few places where the pizza is not far from the entrance, so you might want to take advantage and heal up all your turtles. And number three, Don is objectively the best, so you'll really want to keep him alive for as long as possible. Alright guys, there's some good and there's some bad, but overall, I give TMNT for the NES a 7 out of 10. I did a video recently of some, you know, bad NES games that I like, and this game was on the list. Now when I did the video, which was only just a few weeks ago, I had never beat this game. But during my playthrough for my review, I did manage to beat the game. So like I said, if you just stick with it and you, you pay attention to how the game works, or maybe you look up some guides, it is possible to get good at this game, and honestly, those frustrations kind of go away. So what do you guys think of this game? Do you think this game sucks shit? Do you think it's pretty good? Have you beat it? Tell me about that in the comments below. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you guys next week. TMNT 2 the arcade game was developed by Konami and released on the NES in 1990. It is, of course, based off the TMNT arcade game released the year before. TMNT 2 is a traditional beat-em-up capable of two-player co-op. As per usual, you may choose whichever turtle you'd like. All the turtles are practically the same. They all have the same speed, strength, and range. All their special attacks are also the same. There is just one very minor difference. Raph has an extra pixel or so of range, so he technically has the best range, which is unexpected. But the difference is so minuscule that really they're all the same. I honestly don't know how I feel about this. On one hand, having all the turtles the same is nice because you can just pick your favorite turtle and go. You don't have to worry about your favorite turtle having stats that don't fit your playstyle. But on the other hand, it lowers replay value and can lead to the game feeling more bland. You'll play through seven stages while fighting a variety of familiar enemies. The controls are simple. A is jump, B is attack, pressing B while in the air allows you to kick, and pressing A and B together allows you to do your special attack, but you have to press A slightly before you press B. The levels are pretty straightforward, just move to the right and beat the boss. This isn't inherently a bad thing, though the levels do start to feel slightly repetitive. There are a few deviations, like in stage 2 where you scroll down, but for the most part, you just walk right. Now, Team NT2 is not an easy game by any means, but if you spam your special attack, you'll be fine. You can use it infinitely, as it does not drain your health. The last few bosses, though, good luck. During your playthrough, you'll be subjected to product placement. A lot of these levels have Pizza Hut signs. Now, a lot of people don't like the product placement in this game, but I actually love it. If you've watched any of my older, shittier reviews, you may have heard me talk about how much I love signs in retro video games. This game is no exception. The product placement even works on me. Every time I play this, I order pizza. Except, I order from Domino's, so they reap the benefits of the ad campaign that Pizza Hut paid for. <laughs> The graphics and music are both well done. Together, they do a great job at bringing the 80s cartoon to your NES. The cutscenes between stages also really help to add to the overall presentation. So that's TMNT 2 the arcade game. There really isn't much to say about this game, and that's not a bad thing. What you see is what you get. They played it safe, however, as all the turtles are the same and the levels are a little bland. Is this a negative thing? Well, that's up to you. On the plus side, the TMNT universe is well represented here, and there's two-player co-op. Overall, I give TMNT 2 the arcade game an 8 out of 10. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. Please give a like, please subscribe if you're new here, and I want you to tell me what your favorite pizza toppings are. I'm just a pepperoni guy. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next week. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project was released for the NES in North America in 1992. This game was specifically designed for the NES, meaning that it's not a port of a previous game. It's completely original. It's capable of two-player co-op, and like always, you may choose any one of the four turtles. The big difference between this game and TMNT 2, the arcade game, is that in this game, all the turtles are unique. I'll get into this a little more later. The game opens with a cutscene where the turtles are on vacation in Key West, Florida. While watching the news, they witness Shredder kidnap April and lift Manhattan into the air. After Shredder taunts the turtles, our heroes jump into action. TMNT 3 has 8 levels. This time around, the stages are a lot more interesting. See, in TMNT 2, most of the stages were kinda bland, and for the most part, you would just move to the right. 
but in TMNT 3, they really added some flavor with the level design. Along with moving to the right, we also move up and down more often, and there's a lot more visual flair to each level. For example, in Stage 1, we start off on the beach, then we move our way to the dock, which then moves down and to the right. There's so much to see in this game, and they present everything a little differently in each stage, and it's super refreshing. The story alone promotes variation in the environments. From Key West to Manhattan and everything in between, there's a lot to see. By the way, I can't stress enough how cool I think the idea of a floating island is. I just love knowing that when you're in Manhattan, you're in the sky. I don't know, I just think that's so cool. I absolutely love that about this game. So I had mentioned that all the turtles are unique. They all have the same speed, strength, and range, but their differences lie within their special attacks. For each turtle, their special behaves differently and also varies in damage output. Raph has the Power Drill attack. It only does 7 points of damage, but the range on this makes it safer than any other special. Leo has the Cyclone Sword Spin, which does 8 points of damage. Don has the Knockout Roll, which does 9 points of damage. And finally, Mike has the Kangaroo Kick, which does the most at 11 points of damage. I find Mike's to be the hardest to use, which might be why it deals the most damage. To use the special attack, you have to press A and B together, but just like TMNT2, you have to press A slightly before you press B. Using your special attack drains your health, even if you miss. Thankfully, you can use your special as much as you want, even if you don't have the health to pay for it. Be cautious though, if you use your special too much, you'll be at risk of getting knocked out faster. Another nice thing about TMNT3 is that between knockouts you can change your turtle. Another new addition to the Manhattan Project is the throw attack. By pressing down and B, you'll scoop an enemy and toss them. It's super effective because it kills most foot soldiers in one hit. I should mention the point system. Killing an enemy with your regular attack will net you 600 points. The kick and throw attacks are both worth 400, and the special is worth 200. For every 50,000 points, you'll score an extra life. So you'll have to decide which attacks you want to use and how badly you want that next free life. It's a risk versus reward system here, and I think it works great. I will mention that I think this game is actually pretty hard, but replaying it and forming a solid understanding of the mechanics is not only super fun, but totally worth it. The graphics have been improved over Team NT2 as well. There's still a lot of flicker, but everything looks great, from the character and enemy sprites to the colorful and diverse locations. The music is also really well done and fits the game. In my opinion, this game is a step up from Team NT2 in every way, which is why I give TMNT 3 The Manhattan Project a 9 out of 10. Now don't get me wrong, I still love TMNT 2, but I just like this game more. In fact, I would say that this game is a top 3 NES beat-em-up for me. Guys, I want you to tell me which turtle you like to play as and why. For me, I like to play as Raph because the power drill is super useful, especially in single player. When I play two player, I like to pick Leo. Guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you're new here, please subscribe and I'll see you next time. As we move into the Halloween season, playing horror-themed video games is always a top priority, at least for me. The NES is home to actually quite a few spooky titles, such as the Castle Castlevania Trilogy, and Ghost and Goblins, just to name a few. Those are great choices, but one of my absolute favorites is a game called Uninvited. Uninvited is a horror-themed point-and-click adventure game developed by ICOM Simulations and was originally released for the Mac back in 1986. Uninvited is part of the Mac Venture series along with Shadowgate and Deja Vu, both of which were also ported to the NES. The story follows a nameless man searching for his missing sister. The game starts just after you've crashed your car, apparently in an attempt to avoid a collision with a shadowy figure. It's only after you regain consciousness that you realize your sister is missing. With seemingly nowhere else to go, you assume she must have entered the only house on the street, which happens to be a haunted mansion. I love it. So you get out of your car, and the next thing you know, it blows up. At least you can save money on a tow. Even though this is a horror video game, it still has a sarcastic sense of humor. So just after your Ford Pinto blows up, you're left standing in front of the mansion with no apparent way to get in. It's locked. Thankfully, the mailbox is not locked, and by searching it, you'll discover a letter and a pendant. The letter actually gives you a bit of an idea as to what's going on. It seems that the house belonged to a sorcerer, and one of his apprentices, a guy named Draken, has turned evil. Now, I don't want to spoil too much here, but just know that you'll have to solve the mysteries of the mansion if you have any chance of saving your sister. And who knows? Maybe you don't save her. I guess you'll just have to play this one to find out. <laughs> Once you take the pendant, the doors of the cold and foreboding mansion swing open, so I guess you're invited after all. Being that this is a point-and-click adventure, the main mode of gameplay is exploring and solving puzzles, and you do this by, 
well, pointing and clicking on things. You have a series of commands down at the bottom of the screen. These are used to explore and interact with your environment. Your item inventory is on the right side. You'll need to search for and collect items because solving puzzles usually means using the correct item at the correct place. There are even some items that are useless and are only in-game to further confuse you. There is, however, a place where you can discard items, and thankfully this game only lets you discard items that you don't need. Now, I have to mention how much useless crap this game lets you pick up. I cleaned out a bedroom and a couple bathrooms. None of the items from those rooms were of any use. I ended up just dumping all of it in this dude's backyard. One of my favorite things to do is to just simply examine the environment and read what it says. You can examine almost everything. It gives you descriptions of what you're supposed to be looking at, and in this sense, it feels like reading a book. A creepy book. Yeah, I find that reading all these descriptions really add to this game's haunting atmosphere. Speaking of haunting atmosphere, this mansion happens to be home to many... Well, how do I put it? Undead occupants who all seem displeased with your arrival? I think Uninvited is actually quite successful at being scary. It doesn't give me nightmares or anything. I mean, it's an NES game after all, but playing this alone in the dark can actually be pretty creepy. Sometimes, without warning, one of the undead occupants will suddenly emerge, causing a sort of jump scare. I find the lady in the hallway to genuinely be horrifying. Imagine you were there in real life, in a house where you knew you were the only person there. You enter a hallway and to your horror, you see a woman with her back turned to you. Well, you're supposed to be alone in that house. I'd shit my fucking pants then eat it. Just imagine the ghost pulls out her cell phone. Oh my- I, I gotta call one of the other ghosts. Hey, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's- it's me. O'Hara. Yeah, come check this out. He, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, no, he's eating it. I, I'm not- I am not kidding, he- He- Yeah, yeah, get over here. There are no spiders, it's fine. You gotta get down here, he's eating it. He's almost done, and he's... He's wearing white underwear. Who would show up to a haunted house wearing white underwear? <laughs> I mean, who, who keeps sending these guys? There are many, many ways to die in Uninvited. You might consume the wrong thing, enter the wrong room, or get murdered by one of the house's unhappy occupants. Each death is unique in its description, and I find it quite enjoyable to read. If, or rather, when you die, you won't lose much progress. The game starts you back just a few moments before you died, so don't worry about that. One of the most common complaints with Uninvited is the controls. They're not bad, but this game's interface was obviously designed for a computer and mouse, and seeing as how you can't use a mouse with the NES, well, controlling uninvited can be off-putting, although I don't think it's even close to being a deal-breaker. A less common complaint, but one that I've still heard from a few different people, is the atmosphere, specifically the condition of the mansion. Some people think that the mansion isn't spooky and that it just looks like a regular house. Well, yes, for the most part, it does look like a regular house. I actually disagree with this complaint, as I think a regular-looking house is actually more creepy. Let me explain. If a house looked normal and was well kept, it would be a much bigger shock should you encounter the supernatural. This is because a well kept house is very unassuming. If a house was all dirty and falling apart, you'd expect to see a ghost. Also, a well kept house is more relatable and therefore more comforting. So to take something that feels safe and comfortable, yet there are all kinds of unimaginable horrors lurking around every corner, it'll change your views of what safe and comfortable mean, and I think that's much scarier. Think about if you survived a night like this. You'd be traumatized for life. Then, when you finally return home, to your well-kept and unassuming home, well, you're not gonna feel like it's your safe place anymore. You'll be scared of your own home no matter how many times you move for the rest of your life. Just look at the movie The Shining. That hotel was beautiful and also super scary. So that's why I think a non-spooky house is much scarier than a traditional looking haunted house. And in my opinion, Uninvited pulls it off well. The graphics in Uninvited are decent. For the most part, everything is recognizable. The music is mostly okay. There's just one track that I don't enjoy. I find that it hurts my ears, but maybe that's just me. The rest of the music is fine, nothing special. Out of the three NES Mac Venture games, I think Uninvited has the weakest soundtrack. So there you have it. Uninvited is a great horror-themed NES game. It just sucks that the point-and-click genre appeals to such a small group of gamers. But if you're looking to get in that spooky Halloween mood, check out Uninvited. You may end up shitting your pants and then eating it. 
Guys, thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to hit them buttons and I will see you next time. Wampum is a single player action platformer that was developed and published by Jalico and released for the NES in 1991. You play as a young Indian brave named Soaring Eagle who ventures into the world looking for totems for his magic pouch. There are a total of eight levels. The first is an introductory stage which does a good job of getting you acquainted with the controls while the next six levels you can play in any order. After you beat one of the main six, you'll receive a totem which in turn gives you a new weapon. After you've beaten the main six, it's on to the final level. Wampum is not a very long game nor a very difficult one, but it is a fun playthrough that doesn't overstay its welcome. Your main weapon is a spear which you jab straight ahead. While in the air, you may up thrust or down thrust. While standing still, if you press up on the d-pad, you'll hold your spear above your head which can block falling hazards. Throughout the game, you'll come across many different items and power-ups. These include items which extend the length of your spear, increase your attack power, increase your defense power, provide invincibility, and refill life. Oftentimes, enemies will drop gourds. Once you collect the required amount, you'll earn a heart container which permanently increases your life meter. You can see how many gourds are needed if you press the select button. You'll also find magic potions which automatically refill some health when you run out of life. You can hold up to three at a time. They're kind of like the fairies from The Legend of Zelda. The main six levels all have different themes like magic forest, water test, and ice ritual. While the gameplay doesn't change a whole lot level to level, there are unique touches like how in the magic forest you'll be bouncing on leaves to help you get across the swamp, or how you can use the fire magic to melt ice in the ice ritual. An interesting aspect of the level design is that along with horizontal geography, the developers incorporated verticality to the environments. This was obviously done to complement your character's abilities, such as the up and down thrust attacks. I mentioned that you can play the levels in any order, which is great. The weapons you earn from beating the levels are helpful, but this game doesn't put as much of an emphasis on having them. For example, you can start with any level and you won't be at a huge disadvantage without any one particular weapon. All the bosses are manageable regardless of which weapons you have access to. Speaking of the bosses, the boss fights are fine, but they're nothing special. Just memorize their pattern and attack accordingly. I I mentioned that Wampum is not a very hard game, but if you find yourself struggling with any level, you do have a few options. First, it's easy enough to grind for health restoring items and potions. Enemies respawn and there are many places where you can lay low and just farm for items. Another option is that there are many frequent hidden items. To find these items, you have to interact with specific locations. For example, if you duck and bounce on this cloud, a potion will pop out. There are secrets like this throughout the whole game, so be on the lookout. When it comes to the controls of wampum, they work just fine. A is to jump, B is to attack, start cycles through your weapons, and select pauses the game. In terms of music, I found wampum to be subpar. It's not offensive by any means, but rather completely forgettable. The sound effects are average. The biggest problem with this game is the fact that you only ever have a single life. You have unlimited continues, which is nice, but anytime you die, you get kicked out of the level and sent back to the map screen where you'll have to play the level again from the beginning. That means there are no checkpoints at all at any point in the game. Considering how lengthy the final stage is, well, this got really old really fast. There's also no save function or password system, so you have to beat this all in one go. Like I said, Wampum is not a very hard game, but with a little patience, I did manage to complete the final stage, thus beating the game. I honestly don't have much else to say about Wampum. It's good, but not amazing. Sometimes an average game is all you need. If you're looking to scoop up a copy, it is creeping up in price at around $75 dollars Canadian. And that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please hit the like and subscribe buttons, and I'll see you next time. Yume Penguin Monogatari is a Famicom game developed by Konami and released only in Japan back in 1991. I actually imported this game, and uh, thankfully it was not very expensive, but that's how I play it, just with an adapter, so. First, let's take a look at the story. You play as a penguin named Penta, who got dumped by his girlfriend named Penko. The reason for the breakup is because Penta is too fat and Penko is not sexually attracted to him anymore. Penko's new boyfriend is the main villain. His name is Ginji. He's fully aware that you're attempting to lose weight and win her back, so his big master plan is to send all his goons to force feed you to keep you fat. Basically, you just gotta lose weight and win her back. Back. 
I gotta say, I love this story. Yume Penguin is a hybrid genre with action platforming stages, along with shooter stages. What makes this game stand out from its contemporaries, besides its dual genre, is the fact that you don't have a traditional life bar, nor do you lose lives. Instead, you have a fitness meter. You need to end each stage with a certain level of fitness marked by this heart. If you end the stage without losing enough weight, you'll repeat the stage. So how do you lose weight? Well, there are diet drinks scattered throughout every stage. When you consume a diet drink, you'll lose a bit of weight, which causes your fitness meter to lower. But of course, stages are littered with delicious treats and enemies will constantly be throwing food at you. If you eat food, or in other words, get hit with food or accidentally bump into food, your fitness meter will rise. You just need to finish the stage with the meter anywhere to the right of the heart. Another benefit to lowering the fitness meter and losing weight is that you'll actually get skinnier and therefore more agile. Doing that makes the game easier. When you start a new game, you'll be a big fat penguin. You'll be a lot slower, and attacking enemies is more difficult. But like I said, as you lose weight, you'll become more agile and more efficient with attacking enemies. This means that gaining weight can be pretty annoying, but at the same time, it really gives incentive to lose weight quick and keep it off. There are three worlds in the game as represented in this great looking world map screen. Each world has one platforming stage and one shooter stage. Normally, I'm not a fan of shooters, but in this game I actually like these stages. The platforming stages are a blast as well. I think what initially drew me to this game were the graphics. I absolutely love them. But it's not just the graphics, it's the style and theme of the whole game. I really enjoy all the bright colors. Look at how nice this first level looks. I love the grassy land you can walk through while looking out at the ocean behind. I love how the volcano is erupting sushi rolls at you. The levels are not boring either. Eventually, you'll come to a waterfall section with with falling logs that you can climb. Now we're platforming and scrolling vertically. And this is all just the first stage. In the second stage, you're climbing what looks like a cake or something. Of course, make the fat penguin who's trying to lose weight climb up something that looks tasty. Also, I was happy to see that there's no lava or fire stage. You guys ever notice how there's like lava in almost every video game? What's up with that? I mean, has anyone actually seen real lava? Anyway, after each world is a boss fight. The boss fights are pretty typical, but that's not a bad thing because they are still a lot of fun. Basically, you just need to memorize the patterns, make sure not to eat too much, and attack. Most bosses will be throwing food at you, but thankfully, they'll also throw out the occasional diet drink. One thing I did find to be a little frustrating is that when you're playing through a stage and you're working hard to lower that fitness meter, and suddenly you fall in the water and immediately become morbidly obese. See, when you fall in the water, it's like this game's version of Dying, except you don't restart the stage. You just keep going, but fat with a full fitness meter. So you better hope that you can find enough diet drinks before you finish the stage, otherwise you'll be repeating it. Yume Penguin is also not a very hard game. I beat it the first time I played it within about 25 minutes. There's also a comical twist ending that I won't spoil in case you guys want to check this one out. Anyway, that's all there really is to say about this. It's a neat little, small, tiny, big fat game. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, please make sure to hit that like button because it really does help my shitty small ass channel grow. I'm Ron Man and I'll see you guys in the next video.